Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Nancy Oakley, and I'm your Education and Events Manager here at Citrus Valley Association of Realtors. Hello, good morning. Welcome to Rev Up Your Listings with Reverse Mortgage. Um, you have Ryan Kleiss. He's with Reverse Mortgage Educators, and he's going to be your instructor for today. I will be turning off my video now, so I hope that you enjoy your class. Thank you so much for joining us today, and go ahead, Ryan. Thank you. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for um, coming to the live stream. Of course, this is a class that we usually do in person. So uh, this will be uh, something a little different for us, uh, but we will get all the information to you just the same. And of course, the class today is Rev Up Your Sales in Reverse. My name is Ryan Kleiss. I'm one of the founders of Reverse Mortgage Educators. Uh, my partner, who usually does the class with me, is not here, but if you wanted to know what he looks like, well, there you go. That's Robert. Okay. Anyways, uh, I'll be handling the class today by myself. And uh, you guys should have emailed to you the presentation you're going to see today. That is the handout. If you haven't printed it out, uh, you might want to just get a uh, piece of lined paper or blank piece of paper so you can take some notes. Um, just a side note, uh, the webinar is recorded today, like Nancy mentioned, but also we have the class broken down into short videos as well. So if you ever wanted to kind of recall what we'd said, you can just, uh, we'll show you how to get to the video so you can just watch that particular area that you have a question on. Let's see. Um, also, um, you are free to ask questions, of course, but I do answer the questions usually throughout the class. And so since we're gonna to be together for a little while here today, a couple hours, um, if you can kind of hang on to those questions a little bit, I'll bet you will answer them. But of course, I'm still happy to get them all answered and we'll go from there. So things you'll need for the class today. Uh, it'd be great if you had your phone with you because there's an app we're gonna download. If you have a pen and paper so you can take some notes, uh, you probably want a big cup of coffee. I'm not saying that this is boring, but geez, a couple hours to sit on a webinar. Um, hey, if you guys are drinking coffee, then I'm all for it. I'll be drinking coffee. As a matter of fact, if you notice me moving kind of quickly for some reason, it's because anytime I get a cup of coffee within like two feet of me, there's a good chance it's going to spill. It's just, I don't know, part of my life. Anyways, let's get going. So what are we talking about today? Are we here to really just kind of bore you with a reverse mortgage? No, not really. Uh, for years, about the last 10 years, Rob and I have been working with realtors and developing content and ways that you can use a reverse mortgage to help increase your book of business. And how do we do that? Well, when you learn about the products and you learn about some of the things that other agents have done to use the product, you can bring some value to your clients and that value extra that you're gonna to bring to them could result in a purchase or a listing which is different than maybe the refinance that you see on TV. We are very heavily geared towards helping clients get to the right house. You see, not everybody that could do a reverse mortgage on the house that they're in should. A lot of times they should sell and purchase their next house with the reverse and you guys get to be the lister of that. So I'll talk about why that is. We'll talk about all these things. So let's get going through the presentation here. So we're rev up your listings in reverse. Um, I will try to get you guys a little like five minute or 10 minute break, uh, maybe in about uh, 1120 or so. So uh, that way you guys can uh, stay tuned the whole time. Well, yeah, right. But anyways, you can try to stay tuned and then take a break when, uh, when I break. All right, so here we go. Today we're gonna to talk about what a reverse mortgage is. Of course, you see those on TV, advertised, you've heard about them, all those things that uh, questions clients have had. I wanna give you a way to be able to answer those questions and some easy way to remember these things too. Well, a reverse versus a reverse purchase. So now we're using these loans to purchase homes, which is why we're here today. This is what I want you guys to understand about using these loans to help your clients buy their next home. So what's the outlook for reverse mortgages? Is this something that's gonna be around? Uh, is it just temporary? Is this purchasing gonna last? Is it something that will only help you guys for one client? Let's figure out what the longevity is for these and also you guys working with them. Now the reverse mortgage, hey, the thing's been around 
for quite a while, right? The government came out with their version called a HECM, H-E-C-M, Home Equity Conversion Mortgage. The, that loan came out in about 1990. And uh, even before then, we have reverse mortgages longer than that that came out before then. Well, anytime you have a product out that long, you're bound to have things change. You got some truths, you got some myths, you got people being thrown out of their homes, you got being people, uh, people staying in their homes the rest of their lives. So how do we tell what the difference? Well, we're gonna do that today. Calculating loan amounts. Well, if someone wants to buy a house with a regular loan, it's pretty simple, right? If they want a conventional loan, they're usually putting down 20%. If they want an FHA insured loan, maybe they put down three and a half percent. You don't really care so much their age, who they are, all those things. Well, with us, every down payment and loan amount is going to be different depending on the age of the client. So we need to know what a down payment will be for a 70-year-old versus a 62-year-old. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted you to have your smartphones on hand, because we made an app for you. Download the app. It does a calculation for you. Even I use the app. I mean, I've been doing these loans for a long time. I don't know, 13 years now, reverse mortgages. If you said, hey, Ryan, what's a 68-year-old got to put down on a $600,000 house? I'd be like, I don't really know. Let me use the app because it's not that I'm not good at my job. Well, I'm pretty good at my job, but that I just can't memorize the formulas. And so we give you guys the same tools that we use. It'll be on your phone. I'll show you how to get to that briefly. And finally, how do I take what I'm helping you guys learn today and turn that into business for you guys. Um, I want you guys to understand something. Although, hey, maybe I think I'm pretty decent at educating on loans. I really don't get uh, paid directly. I don't get a salary for being a teacher. And so I need to help you guys get listings, help your clients. So maybe that turns into a loan for me so I can pay my bills and it goes on from there. So a big part of what I've been doing for the last 13 years, and my partner Rob is saying, look, how do we take what has been predominantly just a refinance loan that did nothing for realtors, it didn't help clients be mobile and get to their next home and turn it into a improvement for your business. So I wanna help you guys turn this loan into something that gets you listings, okay? And then hopefully I get a loan. Well, Anyways, that's the plan. All right, so here we go. That's what we're going to learn today. That's our covered topics. So let's just start out. Let's roll right into this thing. What is a reverse mortgage? Everybody's, a lot of people have different ideas of what these things are and how they work. And uh, let's find out how they work. And I want to try to give you guys an easier way to think about this loan. So that way, if somebody asks you a question in two years about it, it'll be hopefully easier for you just to roll off your tongue and help answer that question, thereby making it look like, well, you know a lot about reverse mortgages, but you at least have now hopefully gained their trust that this person's valuable to me. They answer my question. So let's get started. The idea behind a reverse mortgage was this. Long time ago, right? I, I, the first reverse mortgage I found that was done in America was like in the 70s. And even before then, they were being done in other countries. So they've been around a long time. And the idea was this, we had a lot of older homeowners and a lot of them retired. And of course you find when you retired, you're probably not making as much money as you were when you were gainfully employed. And so your income is down, but you've been paying on a home for a long time. You got equity in that home. And maybe you are at a position where you're thinking, boy, with my income that is a little less than I was making before, maybe the mortgage that I had before, well, maybe that payment's getting a little tighter. Or maybe I need to get some money out of the home to do some improvements, right? I mean, if you were to look at my house right now, it probably looks like a war zone, and that's because I haven't worked on it in a while. And I could use an equity line, sure, to freshen it up, right? That doesn't really have anything to do with age, if you ask me. That's just part of home ownership. So if you go into a bank, right? An older homeowner would go into a bank, and this is what happened. They were going into the banks, and they were saying to the bankers, uh, here's my house, I have a lot of equity. I'd like to maybe either lower my payment or get some additional cash out. And so I'd like a loan. And the bankers would look at their income and look at their situation and say, you know, you might have great credit history. You might have a lot of uh, equity built up. But the problem is it looks like maybe your income, you might have a little bit of a hard time making a payment on a loan. And we know equity lines are getting even harder to get these days. 
and I'll bet you they're going to get even harder coming up. And so a lot of older homeowners were getting denied loans, even if they had good credit, if they had some income, if they had equity. And the bankers were turning away because they just felt like the risk was too great that they weren't going to make enough to make that mortgage payment. So, of course, the bankers, well, they don't make money unless they do loans and clients wanted loans. So here we had this situation. We had bankers that wanted to lend money. We had homeowners who certainly wanted to get money or be able to lower their current mortgage payment. So we needed some type of bridge. We needed some way to, to get people money, but yet the, the bankers feel safe that they're going to get paid back their money. So the idea came about to do this. They said, geez, if we have somebody who has a lot of equity in their home and they want to borrow some of that equity out, well, they started figuring this out and saying, well, what if we had a way that we could actually give them a loan and know that we were going to get paid back even if they didn't make payments to us, right? How do we do that? Well, if we know the house is worth a certain amount and we know this person, according to life expectancy tables, is going to live to a certain age, I suppose we could say, here's the money, the payment that you should be making to us every month. Instead of you making that payment, we will just add it on to what you owe. We'll keep track of basically how many payments you've missed. And then when the home sells in the future, that could be when you sell it, your heirs sell it, or when you pass away, we will get paid back all the money that we have lent you, plus all the payments that you missed. Now, as long as we don't loan you too much, so that how many payments you've missed, plus what you originally borrowed, does not exceed what the home will sell for, we'll get paid back. You were able to get a loan and borrow money. Sounds like a good system. And so that's how we started really with reverse mortgages, a way for somebody to borrow money, even though they might not be able to make the payment. And those payments just get paid back when the home sells. Now, in theory, it sounds pretty easy, but you got to figure that these bankers had to figure out how long someone was going to live for. What's that home going to be worth in 10 or 20 years? What's the condition of that home going to be in 10 or 20 years? What are the interest rates going to be? How much money are they borrowing? So there's all these variables that the bankers had to put into their equation so that what? They didn't lend too much money so that somebody, when they passed or when the home was sold, owed more than what the house is worth because then what? The bank loses, right? So this was a tough thing to figure out. And for years, different institutions were working on trying to do this. Some of them would start a reverse mortgage and then they'd figure out this isn't really working out right and they would stop or they'd put rules in place. So it was just a little bit of a, uh, a mess, if you will. Well, the government, of course, watching everything that's going on, wanting to protect the consumer, at the same time, wanting to make sure that banks just aren't putting themselves in a situation to lose money. Both of those are bad for the economy and for people. So look, this is what we can do to help this out. We're going to put some of our best guys on the job and gals on the job. They're going to figure out these formulas so that we think money can be lent and the equity won't run out. And we're going to ensure this system using FHA the Federal Housing Administration money, that MMI fund that insures regular forward mortgages, we're gonna have that insure reverse mortgages. So now, as long as a bank that wants to lend money based on our rules, based on the HECM rules, FHA will insure it. So if something goes wrong, then the bank doesn't have to suffer the massive loss. And at the same time, the homeowner is now protected because what we're telling the banks is that, look, you're doing an FHA HECM loan for a client, should something go wrong? Should the house value drop and the value be less than what's owed, you're not gonna tell these people anything. You're not gonna send them a letter. You're gonna continue to let them live there. We wanna provide a way for an older homeowner to get a loan, not have to make a payment and live there the rest of their lives. So that was the deal that started around 1990. Banks were saying, hey, this is kind of, this is good. We've been trying to do this for a long time with some success, not successful. And now that FHA is insuring it, hey, we're really into this. We want to lend this money. And for the homeowners, it was good too, because now the homeowners knew they had something that the FHA was insuring. There was rules that the banks absolutely had to follow to protect the consumer. And we had 
a real loan here, okay? And so we've now had this HECM loan well, for a long time, since 1990 or so. And this has been what the majority of the loans that are reverses are currently being done. Now, there are some non-government, non-HECM reverse mortgages, if you will, and they're called proprietary reverses. We'll talk about those later, but for now, we're basically gonna focus on the home equity conversion mortgage because that is the majority of the reverse mortgages being done. So we're gonna focus on that. So like we have up on the screen here, reverse mortgage allows your older homeowner refinance a home, get some equity out. They don't have to make a monthly mortgage payment and they get to live there for the rest of their lives. So this was the deal. This is what a lot of older homeowners said, this works for me. Now we'll talk about, of course, how this could be good and bad later on coming up, but this was the kind of deal. A lot of people like this idea. So the loan started happening. Now, one of the things that really makes this loan work, you gotta understand is remember I talked about banks wanting to lend money, but because people weren't really qualifying with what they felt was a good risk profile for the bank, they were giving them loans. So in order for this reverse mortgage, this heck of thing to really work, we really couldn't qualify people like a regular loan because they weren't qualifying. So what we had to do is have a system where we say, we'll lend you money, but we're not going to be going through the things a normal loan does. And this is what gives the, the heck of reverse and the, in the other proprietary reverse mortgages a lot of power. We're simply qualifying totally different than your regular loans. And this has given the heck of a lot of legs throughout the years. I can tell you that even though a reverse mortgage sounds great, a lot of people want it, a lot of people are saying, well, maybe I'm, I heard about this reverse, but I don't really know if I want the thing, right? And after they go through trying to get other loans and they come to the conclusion that they can't get any other loans and the reverse mortgage can be done because they can actually qualify, that's the loan have longevity. I've been doing these reverse mortgages for quite a while now, 13 years or so. I really haven't had anybody ever call me up and go, hey, Ryan, I've been waiting to get a reverse mortgage since I was 30 years old. I'm so excited to call you today. I want a reverse mortgage. And that just hasn't really happened in 13 years of doing these loans. What I do get a lot of people calling going, Ryan, I, I think this reverse mortgage might be something that I want to know about or maybe I want to do. And of course, the conversation usually leads to, well, why do you want to do this? What, what have you heard about it? Or, and a lot of people are saying, I'm a little afraid of it, but Ryan, it's the only loan I think I qualify for. So the fact for a loan, when maybe no other loan will touch them, you can see how the reverse mortgage maybe has endured even the ups and downs that our industry has had. Because if it's the difference between being able to own a home or not own a home, you can bet people are going to say, well, maybe um, I'll think about that loan that I was kind of afraid of, or maybe that I don't like some things about. Just don't get me wrong. There's some things maybe not to like about these things. But at the end of the day, hey, I love my home. I want to be in my home. So if I got to kind of compromise because this is what's available, I might think about doing that. So I'll go through the, the qualifying a little bit later on, but just understand it's drastically different than normal loans. We can certainly qualify people when they couldn't qualify for anything else. And that's important, especially what? When they might be looking to purchase a new home. So 2009 comes along, right? Now think about this, prior to 2009, I could only refinance people at the reverse. So think about maybe a, a client, right? that's in a house and they're having a hard time getting by. They got some equity in there and they've tried every other loan. They can't get any money out. The payment's getting tight. And prior to 2009, they may have only had an option if they wanted to own a home to refinance and stay in that home. Because if they sold the home and they didn't get enough equity out, maybe they couldn't buy another home. They couldn't get a loan to buy another home. And then a commercial maybe would come on TV that say, hey, we can help you stay in your home, get rid of your mortgage payment, get cash out, travel, you know, all these kind of commercials that eh, maybe they're a little over the top, but people would see this and they go, well, that's gonna help me. So until we had this purchased reverse, people could only refinance with the reverse. And now we have a purchase tool, which is why it opens up to realtors. And this is where my partner and I years ago said, 
although it wasn't a big deal in the beginning, 2009 asked me how many reverse purchases I did. I think I did one. However, the idea and what happened after this loan came out is now making it to where the reverse purchase loan is becoming a bigger and bigger deal. And I'll explain why that's happening, even if nobody wants it to happen, why that's happening. You'll hear me, I think, throughout the course of uh, this webinar here, talk about the fact that not everybody maybe is excited about a reverse or, you know, there's a little bit of hesitation there. And I got to tell you that sometimes we do the product, people sell their homes, people do things, not necessarily because they're like super excited about doing something. It's because life circumstances brings them to that point. Your job and my job, of course, is to take the tools that we have available, make them worst, work the best they possibly can to help our clients. So we have a lot of clients that are in houses right now. They're barely making it by. They're, the data is everywhere, by the way, you guys. I'll go through some data later. But the data is everywhere in terms of the fact that we have a lot of older homeowners. Well, heck, we have a lot of just regular homeowners barely making it by. But if you're an older homeowner who's retired and you're barely making it by, it gets a little more serious. It gets a little more scary. And without understanding how to bring the proper tools to them, a lot of times they're going to hunker down longer than they should. In other words, we have a lot of people who should be selling their homes right now, a lot of older homeowners, and they're not calling you guys. As a matter of fact, if you were to walk up to their door, what you'll see, and I know, because I've had the blinds pulled down on me a few times before. I've had the mini blinds shut on me when I was going to doors because they are simply hunkering down because they don't think that whatever solutions you have is one that they're going to want. They think whatever solution is out there is something that is not going to benefit them or they're afraid of it. So we'll get into more of that later on. So anyways, the 2009, we have the reverse purchase. Now we can actually buy a home using reverse and this is great because prior to 2009, a real estate agent might say, hey, Rob and Ryan, we have a client and they're having a hard time in their house and I think they're going to list their house and sell it, but they did ask about a reverse mortgage, so I guess I got to ask. And of course, what am I going to do prior to 2009? I'm going to be like, geez, I'm sorry, realtor, but I can actually help that person stay in their home. Guess what? There goes your listing. <laughs> okay, guess who is really popular at realtor parties? Not me, because people be like, don't talk to that reverse mortgage guy. He might take a client that needs to sell their house and keep them in their house the rest of their lives. Ah, we know we got to do the right thing for clients, but that doesn't mean that all the time a realtor is like jumping for joy to see Rob and I. So when the reverse purchase came out, this was a big deal, right? Because now we could say to realtors, if you come across a client who's having a hard time, they're tight on cash. And I'll tell you how to find those people, by the way, towards the end of the webinar. You got to stay tuned for that. When we find them and we see they're having a hard time, we know that there's another tool to help them own a home. We can get them to a different home. And like I said before, there are some times when a client, if they could refinance and stay in their home with the reverse, they should sell. Still, when would that be? When a client has a home that's worth a certain amount, we can only get them a certain loan size. So a lot of times there's a lot of equity that stays unlocked in a home with somebody that's refinancing. So they may get the benefit of not having a payment. They may get some cash, but they have a lot of equity that gets put aside that they can't use and they might need that equity. So this is where we come in and say, look, you could stay here with the reverse, but we think if you were to downsize to a little lower price property, that would unlock a lot more money for you. And you would also have a loan that's smaller, thereby making it more efficient and maybe leaving more money in the property. So the hard conversations, of course, are the ones where we're trying to tell people what's better, even when they could have the option of staying. But this does turn a lot of clients into listings. I'll talk about that more later. So we have the reverse purchase, 2009. Party time. I get to go to parties. I get to talk to realtors. I'm not the worst guy in the room anymore because I'm like, there's some stories are getting out where an agent was able to list a home and a client was able to buy a home using reverse and it worked out well. Hey, this is great. Let's talk a little bit about the reverse and how it works. 
I kind of mentioned back up here that a client doesn't have to make a monthly mortgage payment, right? So it's different than a regular loan, right? And so sometimes I know individuals have tried to like make the reverse mortgage like this whole other thing. It's not even like a regular loan. It's so confusing or I don't understand it or I hear these things that I don't even want to try to figure this thing out. I'd rather just not even talk about it. But let's go into the workings a little bit of the loan because I want to just give you a little better idea of how to think about it quickly, even years from now, and say, oh, yeah. Let's talk about a regular loan. I think a lot of you guys know how a 30-year fixed loan works, right? How that loan works is that when you get a loan, let's say you buy a home or you refinance your home and you borrow $300,000 from the bank, and you're going to get your first statement. This is like on a regular 30-year fixed. And it's going to say you owe us $300,000. Your first payment is, uh, let's just say that's uh, $1,500. So send in the $1,500. Next month, you will get a statement that will say you owe us $299,800. By the way, these are just estimates. Because of what? A little bit of that payment that you sent in went to principal and the West rent to interest. And you will continue to do that. You'll continue to get statements every month that shows how much you owe and how much your payment is. We all know that, that's a regular loan. If you buy a home with the reverse or refinance with the reverse, and let's just say that you borrow 300,000, you're gonna get a statement every month. That statement's gonna come to you. The statement, let's talk about the first statement. The first statement, you owe 300,000. Also on that statement, it is gonna show what the cost for the loan are. This is an FHA loan, so it'll have a little mortgage insurance and it'll have the interest. For simplicity's sake, let's say that that is $1,500 for that month. So on a reverse mortgage, you actually get a statement that shows how much you owe and shows what the costs are for the month. Now, so both loans are still kind of the same. So the difference is, of course, on the regular loan, you send the payment in and your balance goes down a little bit. On the reverse, you don't send that $1,500 in. So next month when you get your statement, you don't owe $300,000 you owe $301,500 because of course you didn't send it in. And guess what? The next month you'll get a statement. It'll say that you owe $301,500 and the interest due for this month, of course, because your balance is a little bit higher, might be $1,510. So the reverse mortgage is just a way of borrowing the money, deferring that interest and cost to later on in the loan. And you still get a statement every month. You know how much you owe you know what the costs are, you know what's gonna happen next month. So there's no mystery here. So when someone asks you, how does this reverse mortgage thing work? I'm getting a lot of mail on it, believe me. If you're older, you're getting mail on reverse mortgages. It's all over the TV. Everybody wants you to get a reverse mortgage. So a client may ask you, how does that work? You can, and now just, I just want you to go back kind of what I said, pretty simply. Well, you know how your regular loan works. Yeah, I know, I, got, I make a payment every month, the balance goes down a little bit. Oh, well, if you were to get a reverse and you borrowed money, you get a statement every month and it shows you how much is due. If you don't send that in, it'll add on to what you owe. And that's basically, that's the basic framework. Oh, really? That's all it is? Yeah, it's really just a way to have a loan and defer the payment till when you sell the home. That's it. That's really what you need to know about a revert, the, the work. I know there's some details and we'll get to the finer points in a minute. But if you could just remember that we're just talking about a loan on a home. We're talking about something you borrowed money. We're talking about something you get a statement on every month. We're talking about an amount that you know is due and you've just decided not to send it in. We'll get to the finer points in a minute. But now you, now you can really, if you could remember that, whenever somebody asks you, you don't have to be like, ah, and get worried about it. Just remember to explain it that way. Now, if we look at this loan, right? Go back to the bullet points. Hey, you can get a loan. You don't got to make a monthly mortgage payment. You can get equity out. Hey, I can get it even if I can't get a loan for anything else. Hey, I can use this to buy a house and I don't have to make a payment and all these good things, right? Well, even with all those points being considered, we still have individuals who are going to say, yeah, I just, I don't know if I really am into this. I, I know it might be my only option, Ryan, but I'm not saying I, I still like this because I'm out alone on my house and Balance is going to go up every month and interest is going to be added on because of the interest. Well, man, is there anything else you got for me? And I'm like, 
I mean, if you're talking to me, you've probably asked every other loan person, right? I mean, I don't think I'm your first, I'm not the first guy in the dance card. We've talked about that. If, if, if I'm dancing with somebody, it's because I, I don't know. They, they, everyone else has been asked to dance. So I decided, and Rob and I really started wanting to know, gosh, is there something else about this loan? Another way that we can have conversations because I don't like being the last guy in the dance car. I, I don't like having people calling me, telling me, I don't really want what you do, but I have to do it anyway. So I'll just go with it. I, you know, that's just, it's not a great way to make a living doing things that people don't want you to do. So, you know, we ask those tough questions because I got to know, I got to feel like I'm doing something that people are going to get a benefit out of. And for realtors, I especially need to know that the loans I'm providing for your clients to buy homes, they're gonna find a way to find value in it. They're gonna find a way to say, why would I want to do this? Even though it's the only thing I have, tell me how I can feel better about it. And if you guys got questions, I appreciate that. I'll give you a chance in just a minute, as soon as I'm done with this slide. So Rob and I started asking more questions about from the servicers who service reverse mortgages, from the people at FHA, we started asking lots of questions about the loan. So one of the things that we discovered that we think is a pivotal point in how we talk about the loan and what we want people to know nowadays is that when you get that statement, remember you're getting the statement like you do on a regular loan, the reverse statement's gonna show you owe, say 300,000 and 1,500 is what's gonna be added on this month. The difference that the statement doesn't really show that it should, is that you can actually decide if you want to send money in on the loan. The statement doesn't help people know that. The statement is really kind of confusing. I've been doing these things for how long? 13 some odd years? When I get a statement, I'm still like, oh, man, I hate looking at them. I literally look at them and I'm like, this is confusing. There's terms on there. I don't, Unless I was in the industry, I wouldn't know what it means. So you know what I do instead? If I was an older homeowner, I'd probably throw it in the garbage. But the true power of the reverse is this. It's, it becomes a reverse when the client gets a statement and see the 1500 on there, and they decide, I don't want to send that 1500 in. But the truth of the matter is, is they can actually send in whatever they want. If you want to send in the $1,500 for that month, when you get your statement next month, you'll still owe 300. If you sent in more, your balance can go down. So you can actually utilize a reverse purchase or a re reverse refinance, like a regular loan, so to speak, not exactly, but almost in the fact that this, you have control over this loan where the statement doesn't make it seem that way. And a lot of times people don't know that. If I get a reverse mortgage, or buy a home with the reverse. Maybe it's because it's the only loan I can qualify for, but I really didn't like the idea of the interest adding up and all these things. I felt like that was gonna be giving my house away or losing control. I now know that when I get my statement every month, I can decide how much do I wanna send in on my mortgage this month? Do I want the balance to go down because I got some extra money this month? Perfect, I'll send in more than what the statement shows. And maybe I can only afford to send in 750 and the amount due or the amount that's gonna be added on is 1500. Okay, cool. I've only added on 750 on my loan instead of 1500. So if you do this throughout the life of reverse, it can make an enormous difference in how much is owed as the loan progresses, as you get older. And the heirs and the kids might be especially excited to know this. Maybe they wanna, assure that they have a certain amount of equity in, in a house. Maybe they are thinking I might inherit that house and live in it one day. Well, good. Get the statement and look it over when it comes in with your parents or maybe it's your aunt and uncle or whatever and decide how much you want to have added to the balance for next month. You know it, it's all there on the paper. It's just that, again, the statement is so confusing that without a little bit of professional help and understanding what your options are, a lot of people would just put it away and say, I don't, I, don't, I don't have to send it in, so I don't care. Well, just know, think about this, because a lot of people say, Ryan, those loans really get expensive. This is one of the things that clients say. And I'd say, well, let me, let me do it for you this way. If you think a reverse is kind of expensive, it is more expensive than a regular loan. 
But let's say that you had a regular loan and you decided not to make a payment for 20 years. What do you think would happen on that loan? You'd owe a lot of money on it. Well, if you get a reverse mortgage and you decide not to send in a payment even for 10 years, that's 120 payments you've missed. Do the math. 120 plus the extra interest that compounds on plus the $1,500 that was the original payment, that's going to be a pretty high balance. But it really wasn't like that, you know, something was going on we didn't know or there was money being added on from nowhere. It's simply that instead of sending the 1500 or the 1600 or whatever the interest was for that month, instead of sending it in like you would have had to do on a regular loan, you kept it in your pocket. Well, your balance is going to go up. So after I started letting clients know that it's really your decision on how the loan works, not the banks, not anybody else, not the commercials on TV. You fundamentally every month have the power to decide what you want to do. I think it removed a lot of anxiety about the loan. It gave people a path to be able to get a loan, own a home, buy a home, and not feel like we're pigeonholing them into a loan that they cannot control. There's no prepayment penalties on a reverse purchase or a reverse refinance, which means that you can pay what you want whenever you want. You can sell the home, you could refinance it, you can do all of these things. We can't tell you no, there's no prepayment penalties. And that's the power, I believe, of the financing, is being able to get the loan. If you buy a house the reverse and you find, ah, oh, it's not really for me, you can sell that thing in two months, 10 years. It's not up to us. It's up to you to control your loan. And now that we know that you indeed are the one controlling the loan every month, it changes the perspective. It changes how we want to have these loans being done. Okay. All right. I'm going to do one more point and then we're going to take questions. Okay. Uh, this has to be owner occupied, right? So you're not going to get an investment property and put investment and put renters in there, collect the rent, not make a mortgage payment. It sounds great. I would do that. Man, I'd be like, I can't wait to turn to 62. I'm going to buy investment properties and reverse mortgages. I'm going to be a millionaire. It's not going to happen that way. Okay. <laughs> We want you to live in the property, why? Well, this is an asset that is secured by a loan that we're not collecting payments on. The balance is going up. We want people living in the houses to take care of the house, make sure everything's okay. Now that doesn't mean you can't have people living in rooms. If you wanna let people live in your rooms, that's fine. You can't Airbnb it and live in the house, no, no. But you can certainly rent rooms out to people over a longer time frame. So there is some flexibility, but you do gotta live in that house. It can be a single family, we can do condos, we can do one to four units. You'll see the slide does say non-approved condos use reverse, private reverse. Well, nowadays with the rules changing, we are able to do some condo complexes that don't have FHA approval. We're able to do single unit approvals again. So there you go. Don't get a reverse in Airbnb it though. I'll call on you, I'll turn you in. We want these loans to be used properly. We want the houses to be taken care of. That way we know that we have a long run with these loans. Okay, finally, let's open it up to some questions and let's see how we're doing. So we had um, a question, but they said that it was answered by your previous statement. So I think we're Ooh. good. All right. So no more questions at this time. I just want to remind everybody to utilize that Zoom group chat if you do have questions. But like Ryan said, he seems to be answering your questions before you're asking them. So we're just going to open it up at the end of each segment and go that way. I think that's really great. Oh, we do have um, somebody who wanted to know, explain verified seasoned on down. Okay. I don't really. So on down payment. Yeah. The, I'll go back up to the bullet point. The down payment must be verified and seasoned. Well, much like regular loans, um, underwriters want to know where the money is coming from for the down payment, right? Because they don't want they want to make sure that maybe a seller is not giving the money for the down payment some way back around to the buyer and all these things. We need to have seasoned funds. So as the safety precaution, what I let people know is you should either be able to source it like it's coming from the sale of another property. Gift money is allowed. You can gift, gift money from people for the down payment. We need a gift letter. If you can't get a gift letter, it's not coming from the house that you sold. It's not coming from your bank accounts. It's just like mattress money. I wish I had some mattress money. I got none, but 
you got to put it in the bank account and season it for, I, I say put it in the bank account for 90 days, okay? Get those accounts, get those funds seasoned, and that will allow it to be a down payment. But if your son wants to give it to you, or you, you know, somebody you know, gift letter, down payment, done. Let's, um, any other questions, Nancy, or I, I yes. keep going back? Okay. Yes, one more. Um, what happens if the homeowner lives past their expected lifetime? Is there a guarantee that they will never be kicked out even if they live until 100? Yeah, so, okay, now you can be kicked out of a, house, a reverse mortgage house, but it has nothing to do with that. We'll, we'll, and we'll cover that in later slides, by the way. If you wanna know how the heirs okay. inherit the house and all those things, we'll cover that, but let's grab this question. The government does the life expectancy to try to figure out how much money to lend, but that doesn't mean they're saying if you live past it, you're out. The deal is you get to live there till you pass away. Now, I recall years ago going through the Heckam book, kind of thick. I think there was something about 150 years old. So if you plan to live 150, I can't guarantee that the reverse mortgage is going to go to 150. But anything younger than that, it doesn't matter how much you owe. It doesn't matter how many payments you've missed. It doesn't matter if we've gone into a recession or I don't want to say the D word, but if we've gone into some really tough times, that's why some people and that's why we're a little busier right now, actually. There's a little uncertainty in the market right now. So people are like, geez, how can I make sure if the world's coming down around, I, I know I got the roof over my head. And uh, so that's the one of the things that people like about the reverse. Okay, any okay. other questions? Yes, a couple more. Um, no, not a matter of no payments monthly since at least the taxes and insurance costs for the property need to be covered, correct? Yes, yeah, so thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I asked that question. When, when I say monthly mortgage payments, it's just the mortgage payment, right? So you're gonna be responsible for paying your HOA, your homeowner's insurance and your taxes. And this is one of the things that can get you foreclosed on, which we'll talk about later. So, uh, and let me lead right into the, to this next point and I'll, I'll get some questions after that. Okay. See, years ago, we really didn't do much in asking about how much people were bringing in. Like roughly about five or six years ago, you could get a reverse and I didn't really even know if you could afford to pay your tax insurance. That's not such a good idea, right? I'm giving you a loan. I'm letting you take equity out. You spend your money and your income coming in doesn't cover your tax and insurance. And guess what happens? Well, you default on your taxes and that could trigger a foreclosure. So we had some bad times because we weren't doing a good job at least making sure you could handle your monthly expenses. So that's why we actually have limited income verification now. I wanna make sure that you have enough money coming in to pay your tax insurance. So let's say your uh, taxes are 6,000 annually, that's 500 bucks a month. Let's say your insurance is 1,200 annually, that's 100 bucks, I'm at 700 bucks. I also wanna make sure you can eat and buy soap and do some of these things you know, to take care of yourself. And the government thinks it takes about 500, almost 600 bucks for someone to do that. So I got 700 plus 600, I'm at 1300 right now. And then we use a little formula to figure out utilities. We multiply the square footage of your house times 14 cents. And so let's say you have a thousand square foot home, that's 140 bucks. So now I have six, seven, six, 13, 1400 bucks. I don't, I might've messed up on that math, but you get the point. So if you got that 1400 bucks coming in, I know you can at least feed yourself, pay your taxes, keep the utilities on. So that's what the limited income is. Now, this isn't a underwriting webinar, if you will. FHA in that thick book does have some cool rules where if maybe a client doesn't have that money coming in, we have other ways to substantiate that. So I don't want you guys to try to disqualify or qualify your clients. That's my job. I want you guys just to understand that we're trying to take better care of people we're giving the loans to by making sure they can at least take care of themselves. The credit qualifying requirements, check this out. See, prior to about five, six years ago, we didn't really care about credit either. Well, now we do because what if you've never paid a bill on time in the last five years? What if you don't pay your tax, your property taxes? You don't pay your homeowner's insurance? Well, now even if you have the income to pay it, but you have a history of not paying it because I don't know what you're doing with your money. Now we're concerned that even though we've checked that you have the money, you're still not going to do it and you could end up in foreclosure because it's taxes again. You're not paying them. So if you have a really poor history, 
It's not that we're going to disqualify you. We handle this one of two ways. We either say, look, I need to know why you were late on these things. We got to come up with a reason. We got to substantiate that reason. Again, I don't want you guys to try to figure this out. It gets pretty detail oriented. Or if you have no reason for missing your tax payment, we will set up an impound account. We call it a LISA, which is a life expectancy set aside. So we will pay your tax insurance for you, but it's not as grand as it sounds. Because if you think about it, a regular escrow account on a regular loan, you're making a payment every month. So that's where you collect the money to pay your tax insurance for a client. If we're not requiring anybody to make a monthly payment, even though you can, but we don't require it, we have no way of collecting escrows. So we collect your life expectancy of what those tax insurance are gonna be upfront. So if you're buying a home, for example, you might have to put down an extra 30,000. If you're refinancing a home, we might give you 30,000 or 40,000 less in cash because we're gonna set up that impound account. So a lot of people really don't want that and we try not to give it to them unless they really want it. But that's how we get around bad credit and income, by the way, sometimes with this Lisa account, life expectancy set aside. And that's pretty new and a mouthful. Okay, uh, any other questions? Hopefully, because otherwise maybe you're sleeping, I don't know, you guys are doing okay. The TV's not on. I don't know. How are we doing out there? Any other questions? We've we got the quite a few. Yes, we do okay. have quite a few. Do you want to get through these or do you want to continue on in hopes time. that some of these, I mean, we could do just a quick little rundown and, and, yeah, look, and get some of these have, out. And, and if I know I'm going to answer them later on, I'll say I'll answer them later on because I do okay. want to keep doing it. Okay. Um, what is also, Okay, so can homeowners get a loan if they are not mentally competent? Okay, that involves power of attorneys and trusts. It's a little complicated. I'm gonna say the answer is yes. However, you need to get those power of attorneys and trusts into us because we do have to review them. And I, I don't talk about that too much, but yes, we can. Tedious, we need time to review it. Next and then question. also second part to that is if they are mentally competent at the time of loan signing, can they continue to live there if they later develop dementia? Oh yeah, of course. So um, okay. we do send out a letter, by the way, going to this uh, bull last bullet point about owner occupied. How do we know if you're owner occupied? How do we know if you're maybe competent? We send out a um, occupancy certification once a year. I don't, the servicer does. It's basically looking to see if you're going to say, yes, I'm living here. I got the letter. It was sent to my house. If I'm filling this out, I should be competent. And that's our main way of knowing if somebody is still owner occupying and also that, you know, they're able to be in that house. So that's really how we check. Now, I'm sure the servicers and the government have other way of trying to figure out if people are in the house or what's going on. I don't get to know all the rules because this isn't a discussion about how to trick the government into having reverses on investment properties. So and the main point is that when you get that letter in the mail, let them know that you're still there. Okay. Can reverse mortgage be refinanced with another reverse mortgage in case the value of the home goes up? Yes. Now, it doesn't mean that it's an automatic. We do have benefit tests that have to be passed because uh, we want to make sure we're not churning clients just to make money. We need to have benefits for them. So yes, heckum to heckums, they're called or, now well, sometimes they're called other things. Anyways, are possible. Um, it just depends on the timing of it, the age of the client, the equity and all those things, and it's case by case. Okay, great. And one last question, and then we'll, we can have you continue on. I know we got a lot of information to go through. So yes. um, are caretakers allowed to live at the house if homeowner is living there? And what about okay. family members? Absolutely. So we don't check to see who's living there. And like I said, you, you can even be renting out a room, you know, on a monthly basis or something like that to somebody. I mean, it's, it's just the, the short term duration type thing that's concerning. So a caretaker, of course, your, your kids, everybody. Yeah. So absolutely have whoever there that you need to, to help you. Okay. Great. Let's move on. Cause I am, Perfect. I would think that since I'm doing this through a webinar, I would be ahead of the game and I'm not, I'm totally behind, I, I'm a mess. Okay, so let's get moving on. Let's go through some examples, okay? Let's see. And by the way, um, 
a lot of the information I'm providing guys, like I said, that's why we provide tutorials and things afterwards. Cause this is like 10 years of my knowledge just come and I just come at you with this stuff and I talk fast and I, I want you guys to have the information and I want you to have all of it. So I just kind of plow through it. So if you don't pick it all up, no problem. Go back and watch the short videos or watch this webinar again uh, on uh, CVAR site and uh, you can absorb it that way. Okay. Um, here we go. Let's go through an example. So how would a reverse purchase loan work, right? Let's get a little more of the meat potato. Let's say that we have a client. Now this uh, house is 850. That could be in anywhere in Southern California these days. And it's worth 850. We have a 73 year old borrower. I put 73 on there because remember age makes a difference in the size of the loan. I'll talk more about that in a minute. We have a client. Now in this 850 house, maybe they have a loan and maybe that loan has a pretty big payment on it. Or maybe they need to get equity out and they can't. The payment might be hard on them. Maybe they just have to move. But the thing is, they're concerned about, how am I gonna get to my next house, right? So let's say that this house is sold, you sell the house for them. And after selling the house, which means they've paid off their old loan, they've covered the cost of selling, and they have $400,000 in their pocket. And they're saying to you or to themselves, this $400,000 has got to do a lot of things. It's got to put a roof over the head for the rest of my life. It's got to put some money in the bank. And at 73, well, $400,000 is not a lot of money, right? So you have to try to think about how I'm going to make this $400,000 put a roof over the head the rest of my life and put some money in the bank. So it might be a little bit of a tough task, right? So we say, all right, well, let's talk about, first of all, your replacement property. Now, you could certainly go move to a lot of places in the United States and probably buy and find something for 200000 bucks, put two hundred dollars in the bank, and you solve your problem without even needing me. But for a lot of individuals, that's just not the solution. They say, look, I need to, I need to kind of be in the area. I need to be in California. I, I don't want to make that sacrifice. So what I can do and what maybe you as a realtor have done is find them a property that they think is suitable at five hundred. Okay. Well, they only got 400 cash. And remember, they need to be able to stay in the house the rest of their lives and they need to put money in the bank. So this is where the reverse purchase might bridge the gap. So they've sold their other home, right? The reverse is not going on their other home. It's going on a purchase loan on the house they're buying. So 500,000 purchase price, 73 years old. Based on the age, I tell them I can get you a loan for 250. Uh, I'm sorry, you put down 255 and I will get you a loan for 245. So you see what we've done. We've given them a loan. They put a down payment in. So now they have bought their $500,000 house. They have put some money in the bank. They didn't use all 400 down. They used 255 down. So now they're able to retain 145 in the bank. They got the house, which they know, of course, we'll go over the rules in a minute that they will be able to live in for the rest of their lives. And we've made their mortgage payment, what? Optional. See. I don't like to tell people you have no monthly mortgage payment because I just, I want people to always understand how this loan is working. Just because you don't have to make a mortgage payment doesn't mean you don't have interest adding on. And if you're concerned or your heirs are concerned about keeping more equity in the property, then let's talk about this being an optional mortgage payment instead of no mortgage payment. So that way you can decide every month how much you wanna have added to your mortgage, how much you wanna keep in your pocket, et cetera. It's still nice because what? If all else fails and you can't send anything in, you're gonna be okay. Again, you might have a 500 FICO score. I'm not, I'm not looking at your score. I'm saying, why do you have that score? Explain to me why you have that. That way I don't have to pay your tax insurance for you. Explain to me why these things happen. And boy, there's all kinds of reasons. I mean, the last five years, I mean, sometimes I'm going through two years bank statements for clients, page by page, because they don't remember. And I'll be like, hey, you were late on your um, tax payment in November. Do you remember why two years ago? I can't remember, Ryan. And I'm looking at their bank statement. And I'm like, what was this $1,200 expense on there? And they're like, oh yeah, I forgot the car or something. And I'm like, oh, cool. Give me proof of that. Because that substantiates why you missed your payment. And now I don't have to force a Lisa on you. See how that works? And again, this person might only have 1700 bucks a month social security income. Good chance they're qualifying for this loan. 1700 bucks a month maybe in social security income, 500 FICO score, and you still get a loan. So 
you can see where we start to have some power in being able to provide financing. And again, it's not financing where I'm pigeonholing someone and is saying, this is the only loan you got, just take it. Now, whether you like it or not, I'm saying, look, what this is is a loan. And if you want it to be reversed, go ahead and don't make payments. If you just need this loan because you're having a hard time getting a loan, but you can afford to make a payment, send a payment in. All right. That next slide I have coming up, hopefully it's in your presentation because I usually take it out for the class. But if not, you're gonna look at it on screen, but before I go to it, cause look at that thing. <laughs> fill your coffee cup up to the rim. It, what it, fill it to the rim with brim. All right. Let's talk about usage of money. And this is something else again, this is a tool that we've been using for a while. And the idea is to maximize the potential of what a reverse can do instead of just closing our eyes and saying, whatever, I got it, I don't care about it. Because the difference between knowing how to use the loan and just letting it run without understanding it can be substantial. And it also can be the difference between a client saying, yes, I wanna list my $1.5 million property or no, I don't. Because we have lots of examples of that actually happening with what I'm about to tell you guys. All right, first thing I want to point out to you guys, besides the fact I'm behind on time, is that when the government is insuring these loans, and they're basically saying, go ahead and bank and lend them the money, right? And for a client, maybe you've seen somebody that's had a reverse for a lot of years, and you look at their balance and you're like, man, that's high. Doesn't seem like such a great deal. Well, remember, we always have to go back and see how many payments they've missed, right? Because it's not that it's a good deal or a bad deal, it's maybe they've missed 180 payments at 15 plus the compounding interest. It's just, just they've missed a lot of payments. But let's think about the positioning of the government and what their risk is. Because everybody kind of thinks, you know, I don't want to say everybody, a lot of people kind of think they say, Ryan, someone's making money in this deal. I'm like, well, yeah, the investor is that has the loans in their portfolio because they have interest, et cetera. Which, by the way, let me break one second and, and just go over this real quick. I do have a lot of people that say, Ryan, I just don't understand how the bank makes money. I'm not making a payment. They've lent me money. And you got to understand, you're right. They're not making money. The final investor is not making money every month like a normal bank. They're waiting. Because when the loan gets paid off, that's when all those payments that people missed go to the investor. So instead of getting a little bit of interest each month like a normal Fannie Mae loan, they're getting a big giant junk, uh, junk, a big giant chunk of interest when the loan is paid back. So it's not like the, the bank's not making money. They're making money. They just have to wait. Unlike a regular loan, they got to wait. How long? Till the home sells. That could be when you pass away. That could be 15 years. The final investor is waiting a long time to get paid. Okay. Back to what I'm talking about here. So how it, the investor is making money, but the government doesn't really want to make money. They're just there to insure the loan but there's a lot of risk here. If you look at this example here, right? Let's start with the home price of 500,000, okay? And we see that 73 year old person has put down 255 and we've provided a loan of 245. So in other words, the 255 is really the only thing the client ever has to put into that house besides tax and insurance but that just goes to insurance company in the, in the county, right? But the 255 is the only thing that has gone into the pool. And so at the end of the day, what would happen if you did live a very long time in this house? It's the government's risk. Well, let's do a little deduction. If you buy the house for 500 at 73 years old, Life expectancy tables show that the older you are, the longer you get to live. Does that make sense? It should. Because if you have a newborn baby, right, their life expectancy might be 83 or 84 years old. Whereas a 73-year-old, your life expectancy might be 88 or 89 years old. So the fact that you've made it to 73 means you've avoided all kinds of bad things that could happen to you from a baby. All the different things that could happen to you. So Every year you get older, your expectancy actually 
can get a little longer because you've made it. You've made it. You've done well. But that's a problem for the government, right? For FHA, because they're like, man, every year this person lives, they can live longer. And we have to make sure that we didn't lend them too much because if the house is upside down, we got to put the bill as FHA and take care of the bank. So going back to the example here, if this client actually were to live past the life expectancy, I'm going to tell you that that 255 they put down, and even before then, as a matter of fact, doesn't cover the interest and the mortgage insurance throughout the life of the loan. When I did my math a little while ago, uh, if the client lives about 85 years old, that 255 actually it stops covering the cost of that mortgage. So the down payment actually doesn't even really cover the cost of the mortgage insurance and interest throughout the life of the loan, even if you just lived a life expectancy. So what has to happen here that the FHA is relying on is its house appreciates. So when the house appreciates, the appreciation can actually cover the expenses of the mortgage insurance and interest of living in the home. Without appreciation, you should be putting down more. So the government's actually, or FHA is actually kind of going on the hook for what? Appreciation. And now that appreciation doesn't come or the house is depressed, things happen, they don't come to the borrower and say, hey, you know, the house didn't appreciate, we need some more money. They say that's our loss. So in actuality, at a zero appreciation rate, you should be putting down more money. So that's kind of a cool deal. Future appreciation, whether it comes or not, is actually helping keep your down payment lower. Kind of cool. All right. You guys might have questions on that because sometimes I, I know in class, it's a big point. But what I'm trying to demonstrate is that like FHA is not trying to figure out how to make money. And the bank just does really what FHA tells them. FHA is really trying to dial in a benefit. We want to lend people money, but we don't want to ask them to put a big down payment down if we think appreciation will help cover it so we can keep the down payments down and keep the benefit to the client better. If they just want to be absolutely safe, they'd say, no, we'll just assume the house won't appreciate and you've got to put more money down. So they're really going on the hook for these things. Okay. Any questions? I'll, I'll take a question on that if we have a question on that, because that's kind of a, that was kind of a monster. There's a couple questions on um, paying taxes um, and... I'll get to more tax stuff coming up. Okay. This specifically may be on, on this, this little bullet, this point right here. If anybody had a question, I'll pop on it before I get to the next mm -hmm. slide. Can a senior renter purchase a home with a reverse mortgage since there's a such since there's a such thing as reverse purchase? If that yeah, makes sense. That makes total sense. And that's a great question. We get calls here and we fund loans where sometimes the kids will call in and they'll say, I was told, a realtor told, I heard somewhere through the grapevine that you guys can help a older homeowner purchase a home even if they don't own a home right now. And I'm like, they sure can. And they're like, well, what if they don't have the down payment? I'm like, well, it can be gifted. So they say, so I could give the money for the down payment to the older homeowner and then they could buy the house? I was like, sure. And I'm like, are you, uh, who is this? You know, this is a real example actually one time. They're like, well, this is my mom. I was like, that's very generous. What, you know, what's she looking to buy and et cetera. And the person I think was gonna gift them, it was like 150,000, it's a big, pretty big chunk. And I'm like, that's pretty generous. I don't know that I'd have 150 to lay out for my mother to buy a home. I'm like, cool. I'm like, where is she living at now? And she's like, well, she's living with us. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's going to help the family situation, right? So, so sometimes the dynamics are, sometimes parents, my mom doesn't want to come live with me, not necessarily because she doesn't love me, because I, we have a family dynamic going on. We got kids, all kinds of stuff going on. She doesn't want to impose. So sometimes it's nice to be able to help them keep, help a client keep their independence, give them the down payment. And that's a situation where we told this gentleman, by the way, since you're putting the down payment down, I just want to let you know if you send some money in every month, that might help you to get your money back out later on when the house sells because you're keeping that interest at bay. 
Okay. All right, let's move on. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Well, we have several questions, but we'll we'll go back and get to those. Yeah. I promise, guys. We'll let's, get let's to bite one. this. Uh, let's bite this big slot off here because I want to get you guys on your break in about 20 minutes. Okay. All right. So if we look back at this example over here, the client retaining 145, you see that? Remember, that's the money they got to put in the bank because they didn't have to put down all 400. And that was one of the benefits of the reverse purchase. They put money in the bank. They're like, good, I got an emergency fund. Awesome. And I'm like, cool. So for this client, I'd say, look, I got a plan. How about if I take that 145 and I give you more? And they're like, okay, I don't, what, like an investment? I'm like, I'm not an investment person. And they're like, oh, this is, is this illegal? I'm like, of course not. I would never do anything like that. But I, I can help you get that 145 to be a little more. And they say, well, tell me how that's gonna happen, right? I say, cool. And by the way, this is gonna help save interest. Remember, kind of like the making the payment on the thing. And this is where we're going. All right. It's called an amortization schedule. I call it overfunding a reverse purchase loan. And this has turned a lot of people who did not, who didn't think they'd want to sell a house. One in particular in uh, Laguna, the guy ended up listing with an agent who he called after we met with them and listed his $1.5 million house because of this particular idea. Here's how it goes. I got 145. I could just put that in the bank, like on the last property right? And you put down 255. I tell you, if you're the client, I'd say, listen, I got a plan to get you more money, but I need you to put down all 400. And they're thinking, wait, you're going to get me more money, but you want me to get more money. Okay. Let's go through this. I want you to put down all 400,000, which means what? You're going to borrow a lot less, just like a regular loan. If you put down 400,000 on a $500,000 home, instead of putting down 255, you're gonna have a smaller loan, what? You're gonna save interest, right? I'm gonna get a drink, hold on a second. So in this loan, it works the same way. If I tell you to put down all 400, you're taking what? A much smaller reverse mortgage balance up front. And I love that, you know why? Because we have less interest adding on. So I look like a hero because what? You have a much smaller balance. And if you're not making a payment, your interest is much smaller, it's being added on. So right out of the gate, by putting more money down, you're saving a lot of your equity because you have less interest being added on. And if you look at these columns, for example, you see the year on the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, that's years of having the loan. You see the age, of course, corresponds. And look over at the fourth column loan balance. This person that's bought this $500,000 home, they put down 400,000, they made no payments, even after 10 years, they only owe 177. So that's not an extreme amount of interest being added on. If they wouldn't have put down all 400 and they only put down the 255 we asked, it would have been a considerably higher loan balance because you would have had more interest being added on because you borrowed more money, right? So right out of the gate, I tell a client, this is a great way to save money. Your heirs are gonna love you because they might inherit a house, more equity, it's great. And they're like, Ryan, you said you're gonna get me more money. I don't see it here. I'd say, okay, here's the kicker. When you put down extra money, not only do I allow you to get it back, but it actually has a growth rate on it. So in this case, we did what? We told the client to put down that extra 145 from the previous example. And so they put down 400. You'll see that at the top of the slide. You'll see on the right hand call on the right hand side, I've added a line that says initial line of credit 145, which is the, the amount extra they put down. So what I've done is I've provided a way for them to put extra money down, but not lock it up. So that 145 is not locked up in their house. I say, look, you can get back that 145 guaranteed. And they'd say, okay, that's kind of cool. So I'm saving money on interest, but I can get back the 145 if I need it. I say, exactly, you sure can. So at that point in time, then they say, well, where's the extra money at? And I'd say, well, here's the extra money. What you have is, the line of credit, the FHA did something awesome. They said, look, when you give us that extra money, we're going to apply a growth rate to it. So for example, look after year one where it says line of credit. It's not 145. It's 152. Because they are allowing that line of credit to have a growth rate. Now, you're not making money on this loan. 
okay, you're allowing the government to apply a growth rate to the line of credit, which means you're given the capacity to borrow more. So yeah, you don't have it in a Merrill Lynch account making money, but that doesn't mean the money isn't available for you to use, which is nice. And this goes back to the other point I was making, which is the house will appreciate, right? Given enough time, the government knows a house appreciates. So if they know a house is gonna appreciate, they are doing things that allow you to take advantage of that appreciation. One of those ways in the previous example was putting down less because the appreciation will help pay for the interest. Another way in this case, if you put extra money down, they're gonna say, since the house can appreciate, we will let you pull more money out later on because the house should appreciate. It's kind of like if you went to Wells Fargo. Now, let's say you bought a house from Wells Fargo, uh, not from Wells Fargo. Let's say you bought a house and got a loan from Wells Fargo and you got a $300,000 loan and they said, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you've bought this home and as a matter of fact, we're gonna let you have a line of credit for $40,000 that you could use. And say, hey, that's great. I got a line of credit I could use. Now, after maybe three years, you go back and you're like, hey, I still got that $40,000 line of credit. Is that what I said, 40? Yeah, 40,000. Well, imagine if Wells Fargo said, you know what? We're actually giving you a little bit of reward. It's not just 40 that you can use on that line of credit. It might be 50. That's really what's going on here the capacity to have a bigger line to use extra funds. And what is the growth based on? It doesn't matter if the house doesn't appreciate, and this is what's cool. What if you buy this house, you start that line of credit, and the house depreciates or going into a recession? The line of credit that you can pull, first of all, is guaranteed. Second of all, it will continue to have a growth rate because the growth on the line of credit is not based on the uh, value of the home, like regular equity lines. It's based on the interest rate you're being charged on the loan. So as long as you are being charged for the money that you borrowed, you will get paid a growth rate on the money you have on the line of credit. So I believe this is two big advantages rolled into one. You have put more money down, which I love because you're saving money on interest. You're not borrowing that money right now. And I love that because I love to be able to tell people reverse mortgages or can be very efficient if used properly. But then the second part, which may be more powerful, is I say, look, even though you put that extra money down to save money on interest, it doesn't mean you've locked it up. As a matter of fact, what you've done is unlocked the ability to get more money, even if the house doesn't appreciate. Very cool. I don't expect you guys to explain this to a client when you're sitting down with them. Wow. What I really want you guys just to be able to get the feeling and what I'm explaining with this loan is that the education, the understanding that this loan has things that can do wonderful things if you know how to use it, can make all the difference in the world to the client that's buying a house this loan or somebody that's even refinancing. I want these loans to have a completely different perception than maybe some of them have now in that the power is always understanding a little bit about it and knowing where to get those efficiencies out of it, okay? So this is overfunding, purchasing a home, that overfunding gives you a line of credit that grows over time. Even if the house doesn't appreciate, that line of credit's there for you and it will grow. Look, as a matter of fact, if you didn't even touch that 145, after year 10, what do you have? You have 234. Assuming rates have stayed the same, of course. By the way, if interest rates go up, the line of credit will be more. Why? Because remember, the growth rate on the line of credit is based on the money you've borrowed, uh, uh, the interest rate you borrow money at. So if you've got this house and you bought it and you put that money down and you have this line of credit and you hear the Fed's raising rates or something's going on with mortgage rates, the LIBOR index is going up. A lot of times you might go, oh man, rates are going up. In this case, you're like, hey, I'm going to have more money in my line of credit. Well, where is that inflation out I keep on hearing about? I really want some more money in my line of credit. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but Theoretically, that's how it works. Okay, I'm ready for your questions, guys. All right. So we've got a few, so we'll, we'll get through these. Um, all right, first, is there an option for the lender to pay taxes and insurance instead of the borrower? Yeah, so if you remember from earlier, that was called the LISA, which is the life expectancy set aside. Now, 
why we don't do a lot of those is say for this example here, you're buying a $500,000 home. And if I go back to the other page, if you're not gonna overfund and you put down 255, now you say, you know, Ryan, I want that Lisa account for them to pay. I'd be like, okay, you're not putting down 255 anymore. You might be putting down, depending on your age, you might be putting down 290. You have to fund that entire impound account up front since we have no way of collecting it from you on a monthly basis. Okay, next question. When the loan is paid off, does the payoff go up substantially from what the monthly statements balance shows? No. So if you're ready to pay it, let's say you're going to sell the house or you're refinancing or the heirs, maybe unfortunately our borrowers have met their maker and the heirs are looking, whatever that statement shows, if you have the most updated statement, you're going to know what's owed. Now, you can also see in that statement what the interest is and the mortgage insurance is for that month. And so you can project a little bit, maybe if you don't pay the loan off or you don't sell the house for a few months, how much extra that balance will go up because you know what the costs are. So there's no secrets there. What is owed is what is on that current statement when you get it. What would be the pros and cons for beneficiary? Well, we're going to go over beneficiaries. We're going to, we're going to tackle that one in a whole slide. So we'll, we'll pass on that one and I will get back to you. So if you're planning on leaving early, you get to stick with me for a while Stay longer. tuned. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how volatile is the interest rate for RM? Okay, so there's two, there's multiple products. I can't get into each product right now. You guys won't, you guys won't sit with me for four hours. Just that's just a fact of life. You don't like me that much. We have an adjustable and we have a fixed rate. I will tell you, it's counterintuitive here. Ryan, ask me what I have on my house. Ryan, I have a 30 year fixed. Don't talk to yourself, Ryan. No, the idea is that I love fixed rate loans. If someone was going to refinance a regular loan, I'd say get a fixed rate loan, rates are low. Reverse mortgages are, told, are really quite different. This whole thing, by the way, with the line of credit and the being able to pull money out, et cetera, you can only get that with an adjustable reverse. So that's one of the reasons that the adjustable reverse actually is the most popular. It's done more than any of the other ones. There is a fixed rate reverse. And one of the reasons why people don't fit, pick that fixed is sometimes it gives you less money than the adjustable. It doesn't have the flexibility of the adjustable. And I think a lot of, well, this is just my opinion. I have a lot of them. Some good, some bad. An adjustable loan, when you're making a payment every month and that rate adjusts, scares the crap out of you because you're like, ah, the payment's going up. When you have a loan where you're not forced to make a payment and the interest rate goes up, it is adding more interest on, but it doesn't necessarily put you in a bind for making a payment. So we have a little more leniency. People are a little more willing to take the adjustable loan when they know it has more features or more cash available. That's all I can go to on the fixed or adjustable reverse. You guys can always contact me after the webinar and I'm happy to go into further detail. By the way, this schedule here in front of you, this amortization schedule, we're almost on our break. I ask that you guys don't hand this out, which is why I usually don't put it in the slides that you guys have, because this is very specific to a very, very specific client. I'm happy to run one that is tailored fit to the client you might be talking to. I had agents give this out in the past and I would get a call and the client would say, my agent give this to me and this is exactly what I wanna do. And I'll be like, well, you're not 73, you don't have a $500,000 house, the rate's different and they'd be a little frustrated with me. And so ask me for a custom one, please. I'm happy to run it for you. I'm not saying I'm gonna turn it around for you in two minutes, but I can get it to you in a reasonable amount of time so that way we have the proper information going out. Okay, um, let's, let's cut the questions there. Sorry, I, I wanna get you on break like in five minutes. Let me um, cover like two slides really fast. You don't have to buy a lower priced home with the reverse. Sometimes people wanna buy a more expensive home. So let's say you have a client, they're selling a house for 450. I don't know where that is in Southern California anymore, but let's just be, let's make it up. You could actually buy a house for 450 in Southern California. And they sell their house and they're like, look, I gotta get to a more expensive home. I need a house that's either fixed up or better suited for my needs or closer to my kids or something. And you, then they say, I need a $600,000 home. You're like, oh man, you, wanna, you can barely afford your 450 home and you want a $600,000 home? Well, remember, we're about age 
and we're about down payment. So again, I look at this 72 year old client. I say, based on your age, 72 year old client, if you want to buy a $600,000 house, you got to put down 310. If you look when they sold their 450 house, it just so happens, and of course I made it happen this way, that when they'd sold their other house, they had 310,000 in net proceeds. So now they can buy the $600,000 house, they put 310 down, and again, they might not even be able to afford that 450 house that they had to refinance it, but we are looking at totally different qualified. So they've gotten themselves to a more expensive home and maybe something that's better suited for their needs. They can't transfer the tax base, unfortunately, right? Our 6090 rules are the same for reverses as they are for regular. We don't get involved in that. If you can 60, Prop 60 or Prop 90 uh, house with a regular loan, you can do it with us. So little side note there. Again, FICO score is not considered little, little uh, limited income. Okay. All right, last slide. Hey, before I write your offer, a couple things. Remember, I said that we can get these loans done when maybe nobody else can get a loan done anywhere. That doesn't mean it's easy. As a matter of fact, these loans are tedious. As a matter of fact, sometimes I wake up at night and I'm like, how am I going to get that loan to work? We do get them to work most of the time. But it, sometimes it takes us a little while. We got to pull a lot of verifications. We got to work a lot of different things. We got to do a lot of things to help people get qualified. So we want, I want to pre-write, underwrite any loan before you would even think about putting a client's house on the market. Pre-underwriting, depending on the difficulty of the file, could take anywhere from maybe five days to two weeks. So if you ever call me and go, Ryan, I need to know if a client can buy a house, if they'll qualify, and I send you a pre-approval in two hours, you need to wad that thing up and throw it back at me and say, Ryan, this isn't real, right? No, it's because it's not. It really takes a while to pre-qualify, and we want to pre-underwrite. We want to know that the only thing that you got to worry about is finding the house and getting an appraisal and prelim in, and we've taken care of all the other work. So let's get pre-underwritten. Tedious, but awesome. Okay, you got to get re uh, you have to get re reverse mortgage counseled before you can get a reverse purchase or a re reverse refinance. This has nothing to do with your, how you feel. This isn't about counseling like we're worried about you. This is, is the loan company doing an okay job explaining, make sure that we haven't left anything out to make sure they hear from a third party nonprofit that the government has approved to make sure the client understands like they don't have to pay their taxes, that this isn't a free loan, like interest goes on it, that they have to occupy. All those things I talked about, they wanna make sure that we've told the client. So instead of trusting us, salespeople sometimes, they say, we're gonna tell them ourselves. So I give them a list of counselors, they call, it takes about an hour to do on the phone. Once they get that certificate, that's when I can actually order an appraisal. I do this usually in pre-underwriting. If you've made it all the way to writing an offer and the client isn't counseled, ah, we got issues. It's gonna set us back. And they probably also have been pre-underwritten. So we don't wanna end up in that situation. You guys can't offer money to cover closing costs. There's no concessions in this. So you, and neither can the seller. You're just gonna have your basic, seller covers their half of escrow, seller covers home warranty, buyer covers their half of escrow, seller can color, cover owner's title policy, just the basic stuff. You'll get a hold of us. We'll make sure you set your contract up right. This is a form that's available in your uh, zip forms, mandatory escape clause. Check it out. Very easy. Have that done as well. So what I'm seeing here, I'm going through this list quick, is, of course, we're helping you develop this into a transaction. We're probably helping you find the clients or helping you talk to the clients. So we've probably already got everything set up really well to be successful way ahead of time. But every once in a while, we do get a call from an agent. They're like, Ryan, I'm just about to write an offer for a client. I'm like, I haven't even heard of this person before. What's going on? Are they, did we pre-underwrite them? What, did they sell their house? Did they get counseled? Let's not do that. Let's call us or email me so we can get everything set up for success. So one question is, can you please explain how senior renter can buy a new home with reverse mortgage? Uh, sure. Well, just... I mean, think about a, uh, a senior renter wanting to buy any house with any kind of loan. I mean, it's a matter of, do you have the down payment for what the loan is going to need you to put down? So in our case, we always want to know the age, right? So let's say that we have somebody who's 67 years old. And I'm just going to put a percentage out there, but 
this isn't exactly correct, but 67 year old might have to put down 49%. And that's the biggest qualifying thing right there. Cause remember, we're usually looking for a little bit of income, not a lot. Sometimes if they don't have enough social security income to qualify, we can find other ways. They don't have to have great credit. If they do, they can explain why. So you can see how the biggest thing with can someone buy a house the reverse, do they have the down payment for the age on the house they wanna buy? And sometimes if they don't have that down payment, then we gotta downgrade the purchase price, right? It's not like we're saying no, we're just saying, well, maybe you can't buy a $500,000 home. How about a 400? How about a 300? How much money do you have? I got $100,000 in the bank and I need to buy a place. Cool, 67 years old, we probably gotta find some place for 200,000. So we just adjust our price to match their down payment. And then we start looking at, you know, for a little bit of income after that. So again, no prior history, nothing like that. Just down payment, biggest thing. Okay. Are there loan amount maximums? Are there FHA maximums? Yeah, I want to hit on the slide when we get to that, because I, I could go down that rabbit hole for a while. So we'll get to the slide on that one. Okay. And what is the fee for reverse mortgage counseling? Is it paid up front? Okay. Yes. So the reverse mortgage counseling is something that we can't cover. Nobody can cover. They need to be paying for it and it can be put on a credit card. Uh, it typically is about 135. And if you don't have that or you don't even got a credit card, some of the counselings allow you to finance that 135. So you just have to ask them, say, I don't got any money. I need to get counseling done. And they would say, well, Okay, we'll let you finance it for 90 days, maybe until your other house sells and you have the money, something of that nature. Every once in a while, HUD will give out grant money. So sometimes these reverse mortgage counseling companies get grant money and they do it for free. But that's like a, you know, that's like a unicorn, man. Try to find that, that counseling company that has enough grant money left to get it for free. You could be chasing that thing for a while, but they're out there. Okay, what about manufactured homes, like a mobile home on land? Can that be financed through with reverse mortgage? So it is definitely more tedious to get a mobile home done. They can get done. There are quite a few requirements and more inspections that need to be done. Uh, the biggest thing, of course, is, is since this is a FHA, HUD financing, has to be 76 or later, has to be tied down the foundation. You don't necessarily have to own the land that's on, but then the leases do have a lot of uh, requirements in terms of lease in place. So not a lot of them being done, but they can get done. And if that's where we have to price level, we have to drop to, to help someone buy a property to own it, then that certainly is an option. Are there any instances where a homeowner that is living in the home be evicted if taxes or et cetera have been impounded? Yeah. And we're going to go through that very, uh, very particularly coming up. Yeah. If you don't pay your taxes, I mean, just basically like any house, if you don't pay your tax long enough, the county will put your house at sale to get their money. So with a reverse or like a regular loan, for example, the lender doesn't want to let that house go to auction by the county because the county doesn't care about their lien. They just want to get their money. So that's why the lender will have to preemptively foreclose when those taxes aren't being paid to make sure that they get their money. So we don't wanna fall behind on um, properties and reverse mortgage when it comes to taxes, because it's a very limited period of time to get caught up on those. So very important point. Okay, can a senior use a 401k or retirement account Absolutely. to use as a down payment? You betcha. Okay, awesome, that's better, it for the better questions. Than you, better than that, use your kid's 401k. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, that, that would be gift money. Coming from your kid's 401k, cool. Here's your gift money. So, um, all right. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll carry on. Um, I'm going to mute actually, here. You know, and... one, what, one point on that, there's certain types of things that you, you, technically you're not supposed to borrow money for a down payment. So you can take money from things, but it's not supposed to be a loan. So we need to make a, a distinction there. Okay. If you have any questions on that, you guys email me afterwards. Great. Okay. Well, all right, we'll go on and there's no more questions at this point, but I'm sure we'll have more later on. Cool. Um, so it's, it's all you, Ryan, thank you. Let's go. Okay, so uh, let's run through some data real quick. Again, I'm not the guy that believes people have been dreaming about getting a reverse mortgage their whole life. 
think we end up here because maybe it's a, a tool. It's uh, something that's going to be used for the job. So let's find out why our tool exists and who's going to need to use our tool, right? Well, we certainly know we have some older homeowners. We have a graying demographic, if you will. Uh, we have 10,000 people today turning 65. And that'll happen until the year 2030. And even then people are turning 65. It's not like it stops at 2030, but uh, we have a lot of, you know, 10,000 turning 65 every day till 2030. Uh, you know, almost 80 million boomers, 56 to 76. Don't forget, a lot of our boomers' parents are still alive, sometimes called the silent generation. A lot of older homeowners, a lot of people older than 56 own homes, way more than 80 million in terms of the people who could, in terms of older people, okay? A lot of older homeowners in that stat. So this is where we start to get, uh, well, not, this is not the fun part of statistics, especially if you're one of the statistics that about 45% of our boomers, they just they haven't been able to save for retirement. And don't get me wrong, this isn't a, uh, a baby boomer problem. This is systemic. I mean, Gen X, we don't have enough saved up. Some of us are a silent generation. It's just, it, it's a people problem. But if you are older and you're getting closer to retiring, well, then you're probably a little more concerned about this. So heading into retirement without any savings, that could be, uh, you know, well, it's something that you don't, you're not excited about. And even of the people that do have some savings, 55% of the boomers that have savings, only 20% of them have, you know, something that'd be over 100. Most of them, 20%, under 100,000 in savings. That's just not gonna do the, the trick, right? Uh, so many, many of our retirees are living off of just Social Security benefits. Yeah, 1461 a month. That's not the sweet life. It's a life, but it's a tight one. So when you retire, you retain a lot of your expenses, but you lose a lot of your income. So it's an issue, right? Um, When I meet people and they don't have a lot of savings, it's not like I, I'm thinking they were just not good savers, they're careless with their money. I just, I know, I know what it's like to try to save money myself. I'd show you my bank account, but you'd have something else to be concerned about. No, maybe not. But anyways, it's just tough. And you know, something happened. When I, when I graduated, I went to work for Prudential. And part of my thing at Prudential and securities and whatnot is I was helping people roll over their 401ks, helping them, you know, put in an IRA. And of course, you're the questionnaire. I'd always be asking people, how much money do you have? You have a pension plan, 401ks, all of these things, right? And the silent generation, well, a lot of them had pension plans. The boomers, not so much, right? And, you know, a lot of the reasons that we don't save are not necessarily because we're not savers. We had things change on us when it was different for the generations that were in front of us. You know, for example, I mean, I think if you worked at Sears in the 70s, if you sold lawnmowers or tools or did something at Sears or shoe department, I don't know, you had a pension plan, right? That's crazy. I mean, if I could sell tools, right? I like tools. If I could go sell tools right now and get a good pension plan, I don't know. I'd be doing this webinar. That sounds like a nice job to me. But during that time frame, when our boomers were getting older and the pension plans started to disappear. These corporations started turning for what? They started saying our number one, the CEO's number one job is to increase shareholder value. Now, a lot of companies are becoming woke, you would say nowadays, and they're realizing there's more to having a good company than shareholder value. But you know, we're talking 80s, 90s, late 70s, shareholder value was the CEO's job. And if he didn't create shareholder value, he got fired. Had to make sure he got shareholder value or they give him stock options. So all these things started working against pension plans, which are very expensive for corporations to run. And as a result, our boomers were really probably one of the first generations that weren't getting a pension plan like their parents. And I don't know, I don't remember my grandpa ever sitting down my mom and going, you know, Jan, I have a pension plan, you don't, you need to say this much more a month to equal the pension plan that you're not gonna have that I have. I don't remember that conversation happening. And my mother, it doesn't seem like she was made aware of it because she, of course, kind of in the boomer situation, right? Level of savings than they hoped. So the removal of the pension plan was a big deal. And the 401ks just didn't get funded enough. 
IRAs need to get funded enough. And so we have, we see the lack of retirement savings really starting with our boomer demographic. And so now we start to bring that full circle into back why I'm kind of in business, right? Even though maybe we didn't have that great pension plan or we weren't jamming our 401ks with money, I wish I was doing that. What we do have is equity, especially living in California. Man, you've been paying on a house for 30 years. I'm sure you guys have all heard a story or met a client. You guys are in the business. You talk to people about their house 30 years ago and your jaw drops to the floor when at least mine does. I'm like, you paid what? The house is worth 800 and you paid a hundred. What? Really? Oh man, that's obviously that's super exciting for them. So what we have is a little paradigm shift, whether we wanted to or not, in looking at how we're going to fund retirement. Fortunately, we've had great equity build up by making our mortgage payment. So that paradigm shift is a little bit of looking at that home equity more to help supplement retirement than maybe back in the days. So fortunately, we have a lot of it. We have a lot of that equity. It's great. I'm so glad. I'm so happy to sit down with a lot of homeowners who are kind of short in that retirement area and they got that equity and they can do something with it. That doesn't necessarily mean doing a reverse. I'm not like just thinking every single person that has equity in their retirement is a reverse candidate. I get it. Sometimes there's better solutions. Just selling the house and buying something cash and putting money in the bank. That's a solution for using equity for retirement. Refinancing to a much lower payment. Moving to, you know, so many different ways in which equity becomes supplemental. A reverse is one of those tools, which is why, again, we have a little bit of lakes in our industry and why the reverse purchase is a good tool. A client that has a lot of equity Sometimes a regular reverse mortgage refinance doesn't get them enough money to stay in the house and refinance and get the cash they need. So they need to sell. And if they want to buy a house, put some money in the bank and the house they want still needs a loan, then the reverse purchase can fit that bill. So uh, what, what do we have here? We have 65 uh, homeowners. Let's see, we got 26 million homes owned by people 65 and older, 68% of those homes are 17.5 million are free and clear. Maybe they have no retirement, house rich, cash poor. I'm barely making it by, but all this equity. Seven trillion in equity by older homeowners right now. Guess what, when I put this slide presentation together, which was I think 2013, not I, I had an older slide here, I think it was two trillion. So we've picked up like five trillion in equity over the, about the last six or seven years. Substantial, let's let it help out. Various ways to do that. Hey, by the way, now, I usually don't like to use colored maps because there's so many other things you can think about, but this is a good map. The red is good for you guys because that's where we like to retire. We like to retire in California. Great weather, why not? We have a lot of equity in California. So a lot of homeowners, with all this equity, a lot of that, probably majority of that equity that our older homeowners have is in California. Along that comes the underfunded pension, or I should say the underfunded retirement accounts and the no pension plans. This is the opportunity, this is, this is the homes that you guys might see that look like the homeowner doesn't care about them. I doubt that, I, don't, I care about my home, but I just don't always have the time or the money to do what I wanna to do to it. So a lot of these homes that look like they need work, deferred maintenance, a lot of it's because it's an older homeowner that's in there, making it buy in Social Security, a lot of equity. And there will, I wouldn't say definitely, but we do see, again, this is where I say a lot of people should be selling homes. Instead, they're holding on for dear life. They're white knuckling it because then some kind of event happens where maybe they get sick, their spouse gets sick. Something is going wrong with the home, the car, something is going on and now they're in a position where they don't have the money so then after that usually maybe comes some damage credit or running up high credit bills or trying to go get a loan you can't get a loan so what i'm saying is i'd like to try to be a little preventive in letting people know you shouldn't be in your house white knuckling it you should find another house or area that you like get this house in the market 
free up some cash in the bank so you can start to absorb these problems when they come because unfortunately they do come getting older i'm sure i know my health even in my mid 40s i'm like really already and it hurts my income a little bit so we know it happens anyways this is a good map for you guys it means we've got a lot of equity a lot of people are gonna need to sell right here in california next thing that I think is interesting. And back in 2009, when the reverse purchase came out, and I was thinking, people are really gonna use this thing. Uh, my phone's not ringing off the hook for people wanting reverse purchase loans. Maybe this is a novelty item. Maybe the reverse mortgage is a novelty item in that people aren't gonna wanna use it. Well. With the data that we've seen and how the loan could actually work, in my experience in the last 13 years doing these loans, I know the cases that people are doing these loans. So the next thing I think that was be interesting to know, since I'm talking to realtors a lot, is when would you have a line out your door? When is your phone ringing off the hook with older clients going, you know, even though I don't want to sell my home, I've been here for 30 years, I'm going to sell it. That's kind of an interesting statistic. statistic. Um, there hasn't been a lot of good data on that. Although the National Association of Realtors, just, they did a great study that just came out last year. And it's, the, it's a survey basically of home buyers and sellers and ages. And do you know in that, I, I encourage you to go to an, their website and download that report. And I, it cost me a couple bucks, but it's well worth it. In there, what we found is 55% of the people that are selling homes are over 54 years old. So that says something, right? That's saying that decisions are now being made to sell homes. Maybe if it's even not the first choice, the first choice might be because the other studies say that people want to age in place. So what we're seeing is although people may want to age in place and stay in their homes that have been in for a long time, a lot of them just simply can't do it. So we need you guys to be able to see the signs, to be able to know which one of those clients is gonna be the one that needs to sell their home. And I'll talk about that later on. How do we find those people? Going back to our map, a lot of them are gonna be in California. That's where you're licensed at. I know it's not fun, they don't wanna sell, but you need to be there to help them sell. That's what you get paid for. So getting back to my point, when, when are they making these decisions? If they don't wanna make the decision, Ryan, to sell a home, but they do, let's figure out when that is. So if we know about, 55% of the people that are selling homes are like 54 and older. It's either that or 54% of the people that are selling are 55 and older. Anyways, one of those two, close enough. But when does somebody make a decision? Well, since we don't have very good data on that, we do have data on what the average age of a person is that does a reverse mortgage. And since somebody is usually not doing a reverse mortgage until they've probably decided, oh, this is probably what I need to do, even if I really don't want to do it. That's good data for you guys. And I'll tell you why. Starting about six years ago, the government, FHA, had realized that maybe we were lending too much money to people. Maybe houses were ending up upside down because we gave them too much. And with the interest adding on and the recession that hit, five, six, seven, eight, that recession, houses end up upside down, which means that FHA, I don't wanna say they don't care about people, but I don't know if they were sweating the fact that someone's house is upside down and they were sad. They were like, man, our MMI fund, which has to pay, is really getting hurt by these reverses. So what we need to do is lend people less money so the houses don't end up upside down and we don't end up with that high of a risk. So they've done that. They've continued to lower the amount they're gonna lend people over the years. And this is why that's so important. Since a lot of people would prefer to stay in place in their house, when they're calling us up now, we're denying a large percentage of the people that wanna stay in their home. I would say that roughly right now, 50% of the people that are calling in, maybe more, cannot use a reverse to stay in their house, even if they have some equity. They just don't have enough equity because of the government changing the rules. 
So the conversation turns from, you know, I really wish I could help you, but you owe 400,000 and your house is worth 750. And because of your age, I can only loan you 370, let's say. I can't lend you enough money to pay off your current loan. Therefore, I can't put a reverse in place unless you want to pay your loan down. And then I'm saying, well, I'm calling you because I don't really have that much money. I'm saying then, oh, geez, even though you might have 300 something thousand in equity, I can't do a loan for you. And they're like, well, geez, that just, this, wow, what am I going to do then? I'm like, well, you want to stay in your house? Well, yeah, of course I want to stay in my house. And I'm like, well, what's more important? Just making sure that you have a house to live in or having no house out of those two choices. Well, come on, Ryan, that's kind of a dumb question. Of course, I want to have a house that I live in for the rest of my life. I'd say, well, if the choice is between having no house because you can't stay in your house or having a different house, which one are you going to choose? Well, of course, it's going to be a different house. So now here's where the reverse purchase becomes important. Because even though they don't have enough equity in that home that's worth 700 and something and they owe 400, that equity would work maybe if they had a house that was 600,000, 550,000. And the lower we go in the replacement property, the less they have to put down from the sale of their other home and the more they can put in the bank. So you see what we're doing here? But what you guys and what we're really doing is providing a solution to give somebody longevity in a home. I know this is about selling homes and doing loans because that's how we make our living. But after you've done enough of these and you can see the relief, maybe not mentally because maybe they're still attached to that home, but the financial relief that you give to someone by getting them to sell that home and downsizing, putting some money in the bank, maybe it's a reverse purchase loan, and you've taken them from a situation that may not have had any longevity at all and given them longevity in retirement, it's just a good feeling. So we need to do the responsible things, of course, which is not always the easy things, right? Okay, so looking at my chart here, I keep getting away from my chart. The average age of the person that calls into our company to get a reverse is about 70, mid 70s, 72, 73. So that's really the age that someone's saying, I got to do something. I'm calling these guys because I need some help. And when we are turning down maybe 50% of these people, and then we're telling them, look, we can't get you reverse, but you can sell and buy something cheaper. You see what I'm saying about the reverse purchase loan becoming more popular? Not because people just are hearing about it and just wanting it so badly, because as the FHA kept telling us we can lend less money, we are losing the ability to keep people in the house that they're in. But we still have the ability to get them into a lower priced home with a reverse purchase loan. And that's the full circle, guys. Somebody needing to figure out how to fund their retirement, keep life going financially, not being able to do it even with all the tools that are available in their house, and you and I helping them get to that next place. Or maybe just you. Like I said, maybe they're just selling cash and finding something cash and putting money in the bank. Hey, that's still great. You've still done a service to them. Okay, I, I do one less loan, but this is really about making sure we're taking care of people and getting them into a plan that's gonna work for a long period of time and not the struggles, not the not taking care of yourself properly because all of your money is going toward a mortgage payment and trying to upkeep a ha the stress, all of those things. Okay, enough said on that. So this is the average age, right? It's in the 70s. That's when you would know that maybe even if somebody's not saying to you, as a matter of fact, I've never driven by a house and seen a sign in the front yard that says, do you know any good realtors? Cause I'm tied on cash and I got to sell my house and I'm older. Uh, that sign, as soon as they make that sign, I'll let you know. But for right now, instead what we have to do is we have to be a little more good at investigating and detecting. We need to be able to have conversations because a lot of information they're not willing just to throw out there. I personally don't like to tell people, although I do, maybe they don't want to hear it. I'm tight on cash. I wish I was making more money. The kids and all the schooling and the sports and 
I don't like to load people and stuff like that. And as an older homeowner, I'd imagine that the, maybe there, some of them do, but a lot of them might be embarrassed. So what this chart is meant to do is to let you know that we have people pulling their seventies when we see them in our industry saying, Hey, I'm ready to do something. Even if I don't want to, that means it might be selling the home when they don't want to. The chart before that showed we have a lot of older homeowners, with a lot of equity chart before that showed how we have incomes aren't that great in retirement. You see where this is building to. Largest transfer of wealth, it's happening. Some of that is because houses need to be sold. Let's get to this. Let me see what time it is. I'm gotta get moving on time. What happens when somebody has a reverse, they bought a house the reverse, and maybe they're time to meet their maker and the heirs are wondering what's going to happen with the house can we get the house etc all those questions let's get this handled so if you have a house and it has a reverse on it and there's equity this is pretty much like a regular transaction if you're going to sell it underwater is different i'll get to that in a second but here's the heirs options if the heirs want to keep the house that has a reverse on it no problem it belongs to the estate, belongs to whoever, you know, has been handled in the trust or the beneficiaries, et cetera. All they got to do is pay off whatever the balance is. So look at that last statement that they got. That's roughly what they need to pay off, get a new loan, doesn't matter, and keep the house. We're, we're not doing an appraisal to find out how much it's worth because, the, you know, the FHA doesn't own the house, the lender doesn't own the house. This is just a loan. So just like with the regular loan, if the heirs want to keep it, they got to pay off the lender and get a new loan or do whatever they want. Same thing here. They don't want to keep the house. Hey, there's equity in that house. Realtor's going to list the thing. Estate's going to end up with that equity. So much like a regular loan here. And you can get 12 months to do this. You don't get it automatically. You have to show you're being responsible and trying to get the house sold. But you can get up to a year if you're working on getting that house dispositioned differently. Just gotta communicate with the servicer. That's the most important thing. I'm gonna take a second to talk about trusts. This is much like a regular house. If the borrower is on, only one on title and there's no trust, there's no contingency planning, this thing could go into probate. You don't wanna have a reverse mortgage house in probate. Why? Because the lender is sitting there going, geez, we have a house that the balance is going up. That's the only thing we have to secure the loan. We want to make sure things are happening. So they're going to put some pressure on. And so now all of a sudden, you got to get yourself into probate court and make things happen to satisfy the servicer that something's being done. You just, we just don't want to do that, right? So we want to have these reverse mortgage houses in a trust. Now, recently, we have been told that you can actually add other people to the title of the house. So that way, if you don't have a trust in place, the house isn't going to probate at least, but I'm not gonna recommend that and say that's a great plan. We know trust is a really way to go, but it's between probate and having the, a kid on title. I don't know. You guys decide for yourself which one is a better course of action. But in the past, that was a big no-no. You weren't allowed to add people to title. We can now add kids, sons, daughters, et cetera, to, to title. And we like to do that through closing. That way we know who's going on title and they've been counseled as well. So there's a proper way to do that. And we should be doing things to protect against probate. Okay, moving on. How about the house underwater? Well, heirs. If you want that house and the house underwater, and let's say the house were 300 and 400 is what the balance is. Who in their crazy mind wants to pay that $400,000 balance to get a $300,000 house? Now, if this is a regular loan, you might have to, because you can't short sell, as far as I know, you still can't short tell, sell to a relative, right? You'd have to pay that. The government insured reverse, the FHA insured reverse mortgage, the HECM, has a little cool feature in there. This is what they're saying. If you come across the house that your relatives have been in, mom and dad passed away, and the house upside down, and you want to keep that house, you don't get to pay the 400. FHA is going to come in and help absorb that deficiency to the point where they're actually going to give you the house at a 5% discount to the market. 
So in other words, if the house is worth 300 and 400 is owed, take 95% of 300, that's 285. Figure out how to get 285 into the servicer, refinance, cash, whatever, and you get that house and the upside down portion, well, that's what that FHA insurance is gonna help take care of. It's gonna help to offset that so that you're not paying for the upside down portion, okay? So FHA is gonna help out with that. That's a good thing. So you don't have to worry about, necess I wouldn't say in all cases, but you don't have to really about worry about inheriting an upside down house thinking you gotta pay the full balance. You don't wanna do that? You don't have to do anything. I mean, what's gonna happen is when they realize that the homeowner's passed away, they're gonna send out a letter. They're gonna say, hey, uh, whoever is there, we understand the last borrower has passed away and uh, get in touch with us. And you wanna get in touch with them soon. Just because I say you get 12 months doesn't mean you wait 12 months, it's way beyond then. They're gonna give you a time frame in that letter, 30 days to get a hold of us, let us know what your intentions are. So then you can release more time. And let's just say you don't respond to that letter, you don't care. You can go in there and get the stuff out. Eventually what will happen is it's gotta go through foreclosure like a regular house, right? They're gonna have to send a notice of default saying, hey, we understand the last borrower's passed away and you gotta be a borrower to live there. So the house is in default unless somebody shows us the borrower is still around, et cetera. Nobody responds to the notice of default. Well, then notice of sale comes and eventually it goes through, you know, foreclosure proceeding in California, well, foreclosure proceedings in California. It's gonna to go to auction. If no ox, if uh, no investors want to bid it at the auction at the court steps, then it could go back as a HUD REO from a reverse mortgage. HUD, FHA, they do not want that to happen, folks. It's very tough for them to get these homes after they've been through foreclosure to put them back on the market. Plus now they've been empty for how long, there may be damage to them. They really want the heirs to say, this is what we want to do, or this is what we don't want to do. So the house gets dispositioned quicker. Finally, you could short sell it. So if the heirs don't want it and they don't want to walk away from it, maybe they know the neighbors. Of course, you can short sell it. You get paid your commission. This works much like a regular short sale. Okay, so let's stop and maybe see if we got any questions there. I think I've been talking, I feel like I've been talking for a long time. I'm busy. We got any questions? Um, let me check here. Uh, yes. We have, give me just a minute and I'll get at these questions here. Okay. Can a senior pay off a credit card's debt during the transaction of a reverse mortgage? No. Uh, for the government insured for the HECM, we don't pay off the credit cards and that you can't to qualify. So. You can financing, you would refinance, close the reverse, get the cash out and pay down your cards. So you can pay down cards, you just do it on your own. We're not gonna do it for you. Okay, okay, that's it. That's the only question that we had. I think you're getting through these topics pretty quickly and, and some of these questions that people are having, they're getting, these questions are getting answered. So okay. I well, think we're good. Wow. All right. I, <laughs> I, I tend to believe I'm losing somebody if you don't have questions. So ask me questions to make me feel like you're still paying attention. Make up something. I don't know. How tall am I? Something. Give me something. All right. <laughs> Let's run through some myths. The government of the bank, of course, they don't own the home, guys. This is go back to, like I said in the beginning, with the regular loan, does the government own the home or does the bank own the home? No. It's a lien on title. Hey, we're a lien on title. By the way, if you ever look at a, uh, a title report or you pull up the uh, summary like in a uh, title company's website you usually see two items recorded and they're not recorded for the original loan amount so you'll have no way of knowing how much somebody owes on a house in the reverse unless you get the statement just not going to be able to know the amounts on there one is zero and one's uh, a number that is actually 150 percent of the value of the home when the loan was done you don't have to remember that just know you can't look in title and see what they own. But I one thing for sure, the only way the government's gonna bank or is gonna own that home is if for some reason they have to foreclose. And we'll go through that in a minute. And nobody buys it at auction, remember? Ends up with the REO, California procedures. But otherwise it's just a lien on title. 
All right. Will your errors lose your future uh, appreciation? Well, here's the thing. Whatever equity is in that home when our borrowers have passed, of course, that's what will get passed on. So do you lose future appreciation? Well, if the clients aren't, the borrowers aren't making payments, you may lose some of that money because the balance is going up. Whatever equity is left in that house, when you take possession of it, is the equity that's for the estate. So you don't necessarily lose it. I just can't tell you how much is going to be there. Can you inherit the home? We just went through that. Of course they can't. They have to do something. They just don't get it. You got to take some action. But yes, put the house in a trust, please. The house ends up underwater. Can I no longer live there? No, that's why a lot of people do these reverses. Because they at least want to know, as long as I follow whatever rules you're telling me, I'll have this roof over my head. That's why people like the loan. Let's find out how we foreclose, how a reverse mortgage gets messed up. We don't want this to happen. These do happen. I feel bad when I hear about it, but it's because of a rule that we all knew and somebody broke it. Let's start off with residency. Don't you get a reverse mortgage and move out. You now are not owner occupied. You could get foreclosed and you're violating the terms of the loan. But what if I'm sick, Ryan? Okay, good. You can't, not okay, good, you're sick. Sorry, that sounded terrible. Um, if you've got to go to a hospital or nursing home, something like that, you've got to go someplace because you're not doing well. Then you can be gone for a year, okay? And if you get better and get yourself back before that year is up, guess what? You've reestablished residency. You actually go for another year again. So you don't just get one year. You get multiple years. You just can't stack them. You have to make it back and reestablish your residency. You got to get that release paperwork. You got to be able to say, look, here's when I went in and here's when I left. Now, is the servicer going to know that you're gone? They may not know. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep your paperwork in order. Or if you know somebody that has a reverse and they're going into a facility, you want to make sure you get that intake paperwork and keep track of those days because you want to have proof just in case the servicer does know that they're gone. Okay, but there you go. Residency. They want someone living there. And if not, they don't want you gone a long time without ever coming back. Pay your property tax insurance. Here's what I'm talking about. You don't pay your taxes, you're going to end up in a foreclosure situation, and we want you to get caught up real quick. Now, there are some things where, uh, you know, the government does have some rules in place for how you can get caught up. So if you end up in that situation, there are some things that you can do to try to get caught up, but it doesn't mean that you automatically will be approved for that. There has to be certain situations. So the best thing to do, pay your taxes. Same thing with their homeowner insurance. Same thing with their HOA fees. So. Remember, we can do that LISA, which is the life expectancy set aside, which is the impound account, but that's only gonna pay the tax insurance. It won't pay the HOA. So, and remember, it costs a lot of money up front to start that account. So I would just kind of count on making your tax and insurance payment because you can go into foreclosure. And uh, that did cause a lot of problems for us in the past, a lot of problems. That's why we started checking income. We just didn't want to give out houses anymore and that people have no chance of ever making a tax payment because they don't make enough. I wasn't putting people in a very good situation and reverse mortgages were doing that for a bit. Maintain the home. What does that mean? There is a list on FHA's website and uh, it's basically like this. If you're gonna be living in the house, we don't want health and safety issues popping up. But how, if a window's broken, you gotta fix that. Roof is leaking, you should fix that. Now, they don't go out and inspect but there are other ways that they find out that something is wrong with the house. Somebody complaining, maybe some type of uh, county or city action because you haven't done something. Um, I, I gotta tell you, in my 13 years of doing these kinds of loans, I haven't had a client ever call and say they've received a notice. And I've only really heard about it a couple of times with houses in really bad shape. So for the most part, this is what I tell my clients. When you got your reverse, you had an appraisal done and that appraiser checked off and said it meets the requirements. So keep your house in the basic shape it was when you got your loan and you're gonna be okay. All right, uh, let's see. I uh, just wanna see if there's any, we're gonna go through a, an additional point to know about the uh, occupancy in another slide. Um, 
this is really how you mess up a reverse, guys. Is it the back in the day before we changed those property tax, before we started looking at income and doing some things, our foreclosure rate was pretty high. Um, but understand that sometimes the foreclosure rates in reverses can be, well, it's not really what it is. And I know that sometimes people don't pick up on that. They just hear reverse mortgages have a high default rate and they think that it's because the reverse is doing something to somebody. And that's not necessarily the case. You gotta remember, for instance, if a borrower passes away and the heirs don't show up, the lender puts that house in default. So it's not like we're foreclosing on somebody that's living there. They've passed away and nobody showed up. And that shows up as well, a foreclosure. Doesn't mean you're necessarily foreclosing on somebody that's living there. Same thing with taxes. We're not necessarily foreclosing on somebody because, um, you know, any other reason, then they just didn't pay their taxes. So foreclosure rates sometimes can be deceiving in our industry. So you got to kind of know, you always got to know the underlying thing of what's going on. So you can decide, oh, no wonder why they um, didn't pay their taxes. Oh, something, you know, it's usually explainable as to why. All right, moving on. This is where we talk about loan amounts and that calculator I mentioned. So if you have an iPhone, you can break that thing out and go to your app store. If you have a Android phone, you can go to your Google Play Store. If you have anything else, I don't know what to tell you other than to go get a Android phone or an iPhone because our app works on those two phones. And you go to the store, you download it, you go to those app stores, download it, it's free. And you do have to be connected to the internet because it does fetch information on a daily basis to make sure that it's doing the quotes correctly. And the whole thing with this app is that since we need to calculate down payments based on age and every age is different. Wow, I don't wanna remember schedules for every single age. I can't imagine you want to either. Let me check and see what we're doing on time. We're doing okay. So we want you to have the app. You basically input the age and the purchase price of the house and it will tell you what the down payment needs to be. This was a change, a big change that our industry had to make. You see, as of right now, if you're married, as long as one of you is over 62, we don't, we don't care that the other one is under 62. We do in terms of calculating loan amounts, but we'll still let you get a reverse mortgage. But back in the day, if, some, if both spouses weren't 62 years old, we would say, sorry, you can't do a reverse because one of you is not 62. So the problem with the way it was set up was there was no rule that said you couldn't pull the younger person and not put them on the loan and not put them on title and have the older person do the loan. Well, that may sound fine and dandy at first, but take it 10 years down the road when maybe that 63 year old or the 73 and the 60 year old is 70 and maybe something happens to 73 year old and they pass away and the younger one gets a letter it says we understand the last remaining borrower passed away in the house you have 30 days to do something and the younger person's going what i gotta pay this loan off or sell how am i gonna do that not a great situation right so eventually we fix that how do we fix that well, now we basically say, look, if you are married and you have somebody that you're married to that's younger than 62, we will now protect that younger person when the older one passes away. We will base the loan though on the younger person. So that's why for married couples, it's important to know the ages. Because remember, we, we lend based on age. Why do we do that? Well, think about this. If somebody were to get a loan that they didn't have to make payments on, or mortgage, or reverse, and let's say they're 50 years old, and they're gonna live to 87. I might be bad at math, but I think that's 37 years that they don't have to make a mortgage payment. Think about all those payments they could miss and add on to the balance, right? It's very hard to predict how much, they're, how much they might owe, it's hard to predict what the value of the property is going to be. So FHA says you can't lend that person very much because they're going to miss a lot of payments, a little unpredictable. So you get a much smaller loan amount compared to somebody who stays 99 years old and get a reverse. They're not going to 
probably miss that many payments. So we can lend them more money because there's more certainty in how much they will owe over the next few years and what the house will be worth over the next few years. So the younger you are, the less money we'll lend, the bigger down payment you put down. The older you are, the more money we give you for a loan and the less down payment. So this is why it's very important to know the ages of the person, especially your spouse. So now, again, where as years ago, we didn't protect an underage spouse. If they got the loan and only put the older person on, probably shouldn't have done that. And chances are the other spouse, you might hear some stories or read some in the paper that a widower is thrown out of a house with a reverse mortgage. That might be possible for the older loans. But nowadays, what we're doing is basically saying, look, we won't, even if you tell us you want to pull the younger person off the loan, we're still going to use that younger age to qualify. Therefore, kind of eliminating the reason of taking them off the loan. So that way we're protecting you, even if you don't necessarily want that protection. So if you're married and living together in that house, we're always going to go off the younger age. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Non-married couples. Guess what? If you want to do a loan with your neighbor, no problem. You got to be both over 62. How about if you have a boyfriend and girlfriend who aren't married? Come across those. 70 years old, 60 years old, whatever. You guys both have to be over 62 because you're not married. The thing that allows somebody to be younger than 62 and have the protection in reverse is that they're married to somebody that's over 62 when they get the reverse. So unmarried borrowers, got to be all over 62. Who can you do reverse with? Uh, who can you think of doing a reverse with? I don't know. Somebody that your neighbor, your friend, your sister, your brother, your mom. That's fine. All over 62. Let's talk about loan amounts a little bit because we did have some questions about maximum loan amounts. 765, 600. That is not our maximum loan amount. That is the maximum value that we will base your loan amount off of. Let's take an example here. This is why the calculator helps. Let's say we have a 67 year old and I've said, you're gonna be able to get 50% loan amount. So let's say the house, this math is not gonna be fun. But if you're looking at buying a house or refinancing a house and the value is 67, 65, 600, I will give you 50% of that. Cool. What if you say, hey, I'm gonna buy a house for 900. I'd say, cool. I'm gonna give you 50% of 765, 600. You see, you can still buy that house, but you're putting a much bigger down payment down. Because FHA has decided, look, we're, we're not necessarily in this for people to buy million dollar homes. We want to know what a reasonable purchase price is, et cetera, for someone buying a house. So if the purchase price or the appraised value, 765, 600 or more, the loan amount won't go up, the down payment will. And this is why I tell some people sometimes, I'm like, Ryan, I want to uh, reverse my house. It's worth 900,000. And I'm like, you know, I'm only going to give you a loan amount based on 765 and not the real value of your house. And they're like, well, geez, that, that's going to leave a lot of equity in the house I can't get to. I'm like, I know that's why if you really need the money or you're really planning for your future properly, you should probably sell this $900,000 house and go buy something under 750, under 765, 600. So you get the full power of the reverse and you get to put some of that equity in the bank. See where I'm going with, even though somebody can qualify for a reverse to stay in their house, I always ask, should they though? And I know I get paid for doing refinances, but I don't get paid necessarily for not telling people that maybe it's a better option to sell. That's what we need to be doing, helping people optimize what they have available to last a long time. Okay, hopefully that made sense to you. Guess what? Remember I said there's proprietary, non-government, non-FHA reverse mortgages out there? There are. And sometimes their existence or they work because they will allow the full value of the house. Now the percentage that they lend is less, but they'll use the bigger value. So if you have somebody that wants to buy a $1.2 million house, the Heckam loan, the government Heckam loan is not going to be the one they choose. They're probably going to want to use that proprietary, sometimes called a jumbo reverse, because they may get more money. That's a case by case basis. We have to look at each one. But that's why you'll see the majority of the loans being done are the government, or I should just say the FHA insured Heckam reverse. There we go. So what's the maximum loan amount? Depends on the age. I can't tell you it's different across the board. 
But if you took a 90 year old, that is probably gonna be about the highest LTV and multiply that times 765, I don't know, maybe you'll end up with a loan amount of 480, something like that. So there might be your top loan amount somewhere in there. You use the calculator, because look at me, guessing. I've been doing this for 13 years, I'm guessing. I don't wanna guess, let's use the calculator. Okay, any questions? Let's see if they got any questions on that. No, no questions on that, but we do have a few questions um, out there. Do you want to field those questions right now? Uh, yes, before I move on to the next, the marketing okay. topic. So, it says, can you sell a home from a child to a father and have the parents do a reverse mortgage? Yes. You're not really selling it. You, it's just really a transfer of title. And uh, so we do allow that. And can title be held in a trust? Absolutely. Uh, hopefully you caught the last slide. You don't want to be holding well, any house out of trust, but especially a reverse because the person's going to be older, better chance of them passing away. We don't want probate and reverse mortgages at the same time. It's not fun. So get those trusts done. Okay. And that's it so far. Okay. Well, let's move on to some marketing stuff, guys. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, uh, my existence kind of depends a little bit on doing loans. Until somebody wants to pay me to teach all day long, let me know if anybody out there wants to do that. I got to get some loans done. In order for me to get some loans done, I have to help. We're kind of in this together. I want to help you guys find some listings. So maybe that generates a purchase loan for me, right? So we're team, we're team listings and loans. And I wanna share with you the things that have helped other agents get listings. And also I wanna provide you with a follow-up helping system, okay? Now we're in a little bit of a beta situation with this system we just put together this year. It's called Go Courtem. You see it's geocourtem.com. Okay, and of course you've had to attend our class, which you're doing right now to use it. And what this really is, is a, we wanna help you guys so much that, and ourselves to get loans, that we understand sometimes there's somebody out there that you maybe know, know an older homeowner already. Maybe you've seen that it looks like they're just barely squeaking by. Maybe you see that their house is not in great shape. You've talked to them before. But bridging the gap to get them to list, it just may be more than you can handle right now, right? I mean, I know I list, I've missed many transactions by that much. Like literally, like I talked to them before, I try to follow up with them, I get busy, I don't do my proper follow up. Six months or a year later, oh, they've done a loan. And I'm like, I'm awful at this. Well, I might not be the best at this, but Sometimes it's just really hard to know what's going to transpire in a transaction, and we miss it by that much, right? Maxwell Smart, you miss it by that much. So we want to give you a little bit of help as much as we can. This system is designed where if you know that person, you talk to that person, you kind of got the idea that you know, they got some equity, it looks like they're really tight on money. This is something that maybe they should probably sell. What you want to do is you're going to go to go court them and you're gonna put their name and address in there. And what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna give them information about other homeowners that have listed older homeowners and talk about why they should do this. So we're gonna send them out newsletters. If you have their email address, we'll send them out emails. We'll mail them for you. Not a bunch of them, right? Because this is in beta and we just wanna to try to see if we can turn some soil for you guys help you get that transaction that was this close. So for instance, that homeowner now that you've identified and put in the system, they're gonna get newsletters. First month newsletter is gonna be something like, did you know that if you did wanna move your home, you can use Prop 6090 to transfer your taxes so you don't have to take on a new, you can keep your low tax rate. Uh, another article in there, which I think is a great one that we've written is about why they need to be so careful with these cash buyers. Are these cash buyers that are knocking on their doors that? You know, because some of these guys are the guys that want to buy a house at 50 cents on the dollar. 
and they're making it sound great. Oh, you, yeah, we'll give you cash. You don't have to worry about paying an agent. And, and we know they're not getting the most money for their house. So one of the articles in that newsletter is be cautious of cash buyers. Uh, other articles in there, how would you like to be able to buy a home and have an optional monthly mortgage payment? Why not throw an article in there about that? So that would be like the first newsletter. Second month, we have a letter that comes from your desk. By the way, this stuff is coming from you guys, from the desk of your realtor. Oh, did you get that newsletter last month? What did you think about the article on taxes or cash buyers? Trying to get them to just say, yeah, maybe that one was interesting. They don't respond to that. Month three, they get another newsletter. This newsletter talks about how maybe older homeowners have gone to retirement communities and they love it and they thought they were going to hate it. Another article might be a lot like that I talked about before, which is don't wait too long to make a decision because you may put yourself in a financial position that you don't want to be in. Like if you wait too long to sell your house and something happens and now you fall behind on taxes or credit, something credit obligations, it may hamper you from getting into the place you want to. Don't let that happen to you. So all these articles are really written to help the person that we know might be a little bit on the edge to make them realize there's options out there. And look at these, some of these options are great. Help loosen it up. So we'll do that for six months. We'll basically just kind of court them for you for six months. Steve, it might turn into a listing for you guys. Anyways, so that's go court them. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, who you might want to know. Who might be on the edge of needing to sell? And again, you guys are gonna have access to our video library. And the reason why that's important is because we don't just put this stuff out there for you guys. We, we talk the talk, we walk the walk. Um, one of the things that we do is we kind of try to embody you guys a little bit. Does that sound weird? I don't know. I don't want to embody you, but uh, I want to do what you guys do to see how I'm going to help you get that next house to list with an older homeowner. So one of the things we do is we prospect as if we're a realtor looking for a listing. And we prospect based on our history and our knowledge of other homeowners that have listed and sold and bought because of all the parameters that so they're older, they needed cash, et cetera. So we take what we have learned over the last 13 years and we prospect based on that. And we want you guys to be able to do the same. So we do videos of us actually out prospecting and using tools you guys can do the same thing we do. And one of the videos has crazy results that you, you got to watch the video. It's spooky almost. But this outside of the GoCorum software, which is just kind of a follow-up software, you can put a client in there and maybe that will help follow up with them. Is what if you've gone, the first thing I really want you guys to do, let's see what we're doing on time. I want you guys to look at your sphere. I want you guys, here's some things that you guys could do with, I want you guys to get business without having to doing anything extra, by the way. Just maybe re-looking at your sphere and looking for a few things. Inside the people that you know, there is an older homeowner and there is probably one that's gonna have to sell their home. So there are some signs that you can certainly look for. One of the big things that we find is that Older homeowners are selling their homes or looking for reverse mortgages because it, their spouse has fallen ill or passed away. And of course, in addition to the emotional hardship that creates, sometimes it creates financial hardship. And so within your sphere, I'm not just talking about your older homeowners. I'm talking about you probably have people in your sphere that are younger that have parents that are older. And you should definitely be making sure that you are having open dialogues or just even if you're sending emails to them or a card saying, by the way, how are, you, how are mom and dad doing? Of course, you're doing this because you care, but you also want to make sure that you know what is going on. If one of them's having, not doing so well, you gotta understand that one way or another, that house is probably gonna come to market. So let's make sure that you're the one that's gonna be there to help them. And that's a big sign. Spouses not doing well, is a big deal in our industry of why homes go on the market and why people get reverses. So that's one thing you can do inside your own sphere already. Just make sure you're talking to the younger homeowners or your younger friends that have parents and also your older homeowners that you already know and you're just checking in with them. How's your spouse doing? How's John? How's Sally doing? How's everybody doing? 
Everybody doing okay? You got to be there because it's just a matter of time. All right. So that's checking your sphere for those things. Once you've gone through your sphere, by the way, there's other things too that you could be communicating. If you have clients with older parents, have you sent them an, an email or a card or a letter and just saying, how are you doing? By the way, did your parents, your parents have the house in a trust yet? You know, a lot of homeowners out there don't have trust. It's crazy. They don't have trust. Usually because they're afraid they don't want to go talk to an attorney. They think it's a lot of money, whatever it is. And that's a terrible situation to be in. So this again will help you bridge the gap to make sure you are in front of the older homeowners just by asking, did they ever do the trust? Because you need to make sure that that stays inside your, inside your sphere. It's need to stay inside your book. Trusts and health, talking about those things. Now, after you've made sure that you're keeping good contact with the people in your sphere, maybe you want to know where some of these older homeowners are that are gonna be popping on the market and you don't even know them and you don't know anybody that knows them, but you wanna be the one to get the listing. That's what I want. I think those are the funnest ones. Of course, it's nice to get the referrals. I mean, right, it's great, <laughs> awesome. But isn't it fun when you just kind of get something out of sheer like, man, I got that because I did something and it was an effort and boom, here it is. And it turned into, I love it, man. It gets me going. Let's help you pick out one of those. Here's how we can help you. So we know that Older homeowners that have mortgages that are retired are definitely already in a different class where they have a mortgage payment every month and they're having to parse some of whatever they may be bringing in to pay that payment. So why not ask ourselves who's older that has a mortgage and doesn't make that much money right out of the gate? That's a possible client. Now you can start layering some other things on there. What if they're behind on their taxes? That's public data. An older homeowner's behind on their taxes? That's probably not a great sign. You need to know everybody in your area, in your neighborhood, you know, everybody that is within a few miles of where you live and work that's older, that might be, well, just even if they're not older, that's in tax default, right? Something's going on there. So there's software out there that helps us do this. There's a couple different softwares. How are we doing on time? 20 minutes. Hang in there. We usually eat after class, but I think today I'll just eat and then you can watch. No food today. But we're going to talk about two softwares and then get you out of here. First one, Title Pro 24-7. What, what they are is a data aggregation company. They were actually recently bought by Fidelity but they aggregate data. So all that data that's out there, you know what, I, I believe the number is like, companies like companies that aggregate data have like 100 points of data on, on most homeowners. Isn't, can you believe that? They, oh, they know like 100 things about you? So unfortunately, a lot of that happens without us even necessarily wanting it to happen because some of it's just public record. Some of it's from something you might've filled out and didn't realize you filled it out some type of behavior, something, you bought something, you filled something out and you didn't realize it said at the bottom, this is gonna be used for future marketing purposes. So they have this data, so why not make this data useful for you? Title Pro 24 seven aggregates that data and now gives it to us as individuals. Even if we wanna buy one record, we used to have to buy these things by the tens of thousands, but now they've made it so that an individual can get just as 10 records. So for your own neighborhood, it'd be nice to know more about the neighbors. Okay, so you go into Title Pro, right? And I don't have the time to bring the software up. Sometimes in the live class I do, but basically we will give you logins. One of the things that we will do since you've attended the class here is we're gonna get you set up with logins for Title Pro 24 seven. And when you're in Title Pro, what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be feeding it information. By the way, we have a video on this. So one of the things you're gonna be able to watch on our videos is how to work this software because you want to know. And then what we do is in the videos, after we pull the data, we go visit the homes. We actually knock on their door because we want you guys to know 
before you go out there and do it, am I wasting my time? I don't want you guys to waste your time. I'm super worried about your time. I'm worried about my time. We only have so much time in a day. I mean, I don't want you guys to go off on a wild goose chase. I want you, I want to spend time as wisely as we can. So that's why we invest in doing things ourselves and you guys watch. If it doesn't look like it works, it's not going to work for you. Then, you know, you've seen us do it and you're like, okay, but when it works, you might say, I can do that. So one of the videos we recently did, by the way, which you can watch, we did this. This is the profile we built inside Title 24 seven. And you can watch the video. We asked it to look for older homeowners who had a mortgage, who made a certain amount of money or less, right? Accessing these hundred data points that they have on us. And then we also asked it to share who has a default with property taxes. So what's that saying to us? You have an older homeowner, doesn't make a lot of money, has a mortgage and they have a default. It just doesn't, it sounds terrible, right? But that's what's out there. So we pulled three of them right within around our office. We got in the car and we drove and knocked on the door. One person didn't answer. One person looked like their kids were home and another person did answer. And to our surprise, it was an individual who had been to our office before and asked us questions about loans. She never told us anything. She was very short with us, which I understand. And she would leave and we never knew who she was. And all of a sudden now I'm at her door. She, I, I'm surprised she didn't think I was stalking her. Like I followed her home or something. But you see what the data did? It led me to somebody with a problem. And now we actually know that problem existed because she'd been coming in to asking us questions. Now she was very short with us, but when I was actually at the door, she was like, okay. She kind of gave us a little bit of information about what was going on and she did need some help. Uh, I didn't help her right away, but she still needs that help. And as a matter of fact, what's really funny is I see her in the community now, we're kind of bugged. She waves, she comes in and gets candy from her office. It's a whole different thing now. But you can do that kind of stuff. And the software, and I thought to get those, those records, by the way, I think it was 18 cents. 18 cents for a lead right in our area. So I want you guys to have fun with this if you want to. I'm not saying this becomes your whole marketing program. I'm not saying anything. I'm not guaranteeing you anything either. What I'm saying is there are tools that are fun and we'll get you access to them and you can just kind of watch what we do and see if you want to have some fun and give us a call. I'll go with you. Why not? It's fun. I enjoy it. I enjoy prospecting. I enjoy the feeling of taking something from nothing and we made it into a listing for you. That just sounds like a good time to me. Let's, let's go right now. I don't know. Where's my keys? Okay. That's Title Pro 24-7. You can even, uh, by the way, that lady who, you know, we didn't want to pressure her or anything. We just want to know that we're there. When we went to the door, we just want to let her know we're in the area and we help people. And guess what? She's going to get dropped and go court them. And she'll get a letter from us. And she'll really remember us. Let's talk about Remind. You have Remind already. It's free. It's in your CRMLS. If you haven't Remind your neighborhood, do so. Here's what I would think would, when, if you guys have a little extra time, I know I think you guys are allowed to go back out and start prospecting or meeting with your clients, which is, you know, be careful, but we got to do business. But if you are still going to be at home a lot, up on the computer and that last software, which was Title Pro, do what we did. Watch one of our videos, see how we, we, we brought the search in to right around by our office so it's close. That way we know it's easy to go to. And do it for your neighborhood. Maybe somebody on your street is late on their property taxes. That's a great person just to leave a flyer on, let them know you help people that are in default with their property taxes, just things like that, right? So you want to title pro and do your neighborhood. Next thing you want to do is remind your neighborhood. So you're going to log into your CRMLS. When you're in your CRMLS and you get to the screen that has all the buttons on it, one is to go to matrix, one's like lines, desk, there's just a whole bunch of buttons on that page after you log in. You're going to click the remind button. And if you look on the screen on the left-hand side, you'll see it says remind. And that's the craziest little symbol. I asked the guy what it was one time. And he told me, I, I don't know what that thing is. It's like an amoeba or something or a cell. I don't know. 
anyways, Remind does kind of what we were doing in that, with that Title Pro software, but they do it for you. See, Title Pro, we're gonna have you put in specifics and build the formula to find people. Remind builds the formula for you and says, we think these people are gonna sell. All you gotta do is open up your Remind, let the software do the work, and these people probably have a chance of selling. How do they know? Well, they have taken those data points on homeowners, looked at the ones that have sold, and said, if we can see that the data points on this person that sold a home, and the data points are about to match this other guy who hasn't sold yet, but the data points are starting to line up with each other, there's a very good chance that person's gonna sell their home too, because everybody else with those data points sold. So why wouldn't this person, as soon as those data points match, you could call it AI. I don't know. I just call it programming. I call it common sense. If you know every single person on your street that had a blue house, sold their house one year after owning it, I would start knocking on all those blue house doors going, when can I list your house? That's what Remind's doing. Commonalities, common sense. They just do it with a lot of data. Here we go. When you remine a house, Again, I'm not doing this live, but you can do it live. If you tell it to, it's okay to know where your location is, it should bring it over to your neighborhood. And you're gonna tell it, like on our screen, you'll see we've check marked high score. We're looking at the sell score and we wanna know high, who has a high probability of selling. In our case, we also did what? If you see there at the top, we said ownership time of 20 plus years. We wanna know older homeowners that have a higher probability of selling because we have special information for them that other realtors might not. For instance, if you know this person has owned the home for a long time, which means they might be older and they have a high sell score, I don't know, or other realtors dropping flyers off or sending them something that says, do you wanna know more about transferring property taxes? Do you wanna know more about uh, moving into communities for 55 and older? Do you wanna know more about how you can uh, keep your house in a trust when you sell and rebuy? See what I'm saying? You're getting a little more specific. Instead of just putting something in there going, hey, you thinking about selling your house? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the realtor of the area. Compared to what you might put in front of them that says, if you're thinking about selling your home, I just wanna let you know there's a way you can keep your taxes low. There's a way that you can still have your house in a trust to protect it from probate. But like things that are more like towards what they're thinking. Or you can go knock on their door. That's what Rob and I like to do. We like to go just meet the people. Be to the street, meet the people, see the faces, and then send them something after you meet them. So your retention rate is good. And that's why we always talk about doing stuff local. Like, I'm not going to do this in LA on this software. When am I going to get to LA? I'm not even going to do it in one city over. I find too many reasons not to do it. I really do. So, but if I do it in my own street, in my own neighborhood, and I know that either the, Go, the Title Pro, the other software, or mine has identified somebody has a pretty good chance of selling it on my own street, if I was a realtor, and I didn't make the effort, I, that's just me. That's just, you gotta do that, right? It's on your own street. Two cities over, I ain't gonna do that. Too many other things for me to do. And if they're on my own street, I should at least get up and take a walk and try to catch them outside or just introduce myself. If I haven't, maybe you already know them. Maybe, how many times have you known somebody maybe not great, but you kind of know them and then you've learned they sold their house and you weren't the realtor chosen. I don't know about you guys, man. I take stuff, I, I probably take stuff more personal than I should. When somebody I know does a loan, like even a friend that I was good friends with and I found out they did a loan, they didn't use me. God, I, my feelings get hurt really bad. Just, and my pocketbook gets hurt too. So use these tools, if nothing else, to make sure the people that are closest to you that should use you, if nothing else, because you're, they're your neighbor. You're on your street. Now, I'm not a guy that is very entitled, 
but if someone's going to do a loan on my street, I think I deserve that just for living on the same street. Just because I chose to live on the same street with them, I want that loan. If you live on the, if you live on the same street with somebody in your realtor, you put up with them being neighbors for how long you deserve to get that listing. Don't let it go anywhere else. Use these tools. Use us. Reach out to us. We need loans. You need listings. We're happy to help you guys sort through some of these things. We're happy to try to figure out which ones might be the next hot one to go on the market. All right. Questions. Oh yeah, we've got several. Okay. <laughs> so, um, can you can you tell the name of the app again? A um, couple questions on the app. Yeah, I didn't even say the name of the app. That's how bad I am at my job sometimes. It's. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, R for P. So if you go, let me go back to that slide. Okay. Okay. R for P. See at the bottom there? R E V, the number four P U R. So when you go to your app store, type in R E V four P U R and search in your app store. Don't do it in your browser. Don't do it like Safari or Google Chrome. You got to be in the app store to download it. And if you're not connected to the internet, it won't work either because it's got to be able to come to our office and get the correct loan amount. There, there might be other apps out there that do this thing. I can't guarantee that whatever you're getting from them has been updated. We make sure that our app updates when you open it up. So there you go. That's how you find it. Wow. Well, um, the age limit for reverse mortgage, was it lowered to 60 years? There is a 60 year old product out there, but as a matter of fact, it's not there anymore. So this was the thing. When you have these private products that are not government insured, FHA insured, HECMs, they come and go because these are private investors that are really, the risk is all on them. So they pop up, they're here for a while, sometimes they're good and they go away. So we used to have a reverse mortgage that came out a couple of years ago that allowed a 60 year old to do it. That thing's gone for now. So we're at 62 again. Okay, but so it's back remember, at 62. Yeah, but if you have a spouse, listen, if you're 58 years old and you want to reverse real bad and you're not married, the only thing I could tell you, and this is not great advice, by the way, marry somebody over 62 and then you get a reverse and a spouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone wanting to know if the webinar was recorded. Yes, we are recorded. Um, it's going to be viewed on cvar.live. You can go and see the replay on cvar.live. Um, give us a couple days. Steve is our media specialist, and he's got a lot of stuff going on right now. So give him a couple days. Check back Monday or Tuesday of next week, um, the 6th or 7th of April, for that recording. So again, it is recorded. Yes, it's going to be at cvar.live. Uh, check back Monday or Tuesday for the recording. Okay. Um, can you put the step two up on the screen, please? So step two for your marketing. Step one is gocordum.com. And so, then... Yeah, so what yeah. will happen with gocordum is when you first sign up, it just acknowledges you've signed up and it shows you the materials, right? Because uh, we would never dream of sending something to somebody that you haven't approved. Now, that doesn't mean you tell us you want to make changes. It kind of is what it is. But at least you see what's going to be sent if you got to get it signed off by somebody. And then after that, you go back in and put the people's information in for it to go out too. So it's a couple of steps you got to do for it to start working. And we're limiting it to just one per person right now because uh, it's expensive actually. I mean, it, it costs us probably 25 bucks a piece for someone you put in here to chase them down for six months. So we are beta testing to see how this goes. And this is step number one. Can you, what's the next slide? Next for slide. Step number two. This is the title pro. So this isn't go courtum. This is where if you wanna find some more people that may need to sell, based on what we tell you the characteristics are, or you could put your own characteristics, then you could find people. So this is where I kind of recommend, if you can get to our other short video, I actually pop this thing open and I talk about, Rob and I talk about how to make this thing work, how to click buttons, how to get something out of it. I just can't do it on this webinar. Okay, and then, um 
they want to know if you have specific classes to help with this Title Pro. Everything for the Title Pro right now is just done through our videos or, you know, next time we do a class at CBAR, come down so that we can do it for you in person. Okay. Um, I don't know what that means. Will this be for one person or a farm? I don't know what that means. Okay. No, I don't know what that means. Oh, it's okay. literally just for one person right now. We, we can't, we have to get loans to obviously pay for these things to work. So we're beta testing to see if it gets listings, if it gets loans, just what kind of stuff gets generated from prospecting with this tool. So right now it's, just, it's very limited in scope right now. Okay. Oh, they explained. So we got it. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you have content in Spanish for clients who speak Spanish? You know, unfortunately we don't. And the disconnect there is that our loan docs are in English. And until we know we can do loan docs in Spanish, we're just concerned about marketing something one way and delivering a product in another. We don't know, you know. So you just have to stay track on that. Whatever the laws are, whatever the rules are in lending, it's traditionally what we try to follow and we try to keep updated on that. But the answer to the question is we do not currently have anything uh, in Spanish. Okay. And we then, um, sorry, Nancy, we have Spanish speaking loan officers though. Oh, okay. Spanish. Okay. That's good. Um, and then the page, they want to know if you can re put the page on amortization sheet and the page at the beginning back up on the screen, just real quick. Okay, so remember, this is a very specific situation. Um, this is uh, not to be distributed. It's for your professional eyes only. If you want one run for a client or a particular situation, we would be happy to do that. And of course, along with that comes nice disclosures that says these are estimates, et cetera, et cetera. All right. That looks like all the questions. A lot of people saying, thank you so much. Great information. Um, if anyone has any specific questions, Ryan, if you want to give out your contact information again. Yeah. Uh, so our company line, which somebody will pick up in case I'm busy, is 800-800-2190. And I think that might be, maybe is at the end of the presentation? Let's see. My email address is ryan at reversemortgageeducators.com. Uh, Robert, who also usually does classes with me, is robert at reversemortgageeducators.com. And if you have something pressing, you can shoot me a text, 714-609-0196. But there you go. Actually, there's our contact information on the last slide. And that, that's actually the better number to use because that's for realtors only and not the general line. Okay. Perfect. All right. And, um, and if anyone has any other questions, um, like we said, you can email Ryan or you can um, email me and I can get your contact information to Ryan. My name is Nancy Oakley. My email is noakley at cvar.net. I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, please check out our calendar at cvar.net and um, see all the great classes that we have coming up um, for the month of April and May. And Ryan's um, Reverse Mortgage Educators and Ryan, they will be back in um, July. We have scheduled in July, so just a few short months away. Um, hopefully we'll be back to normal by then and we'll do a live class um, while this webinar is really great content and information and we love having you here with us. The live class is even better. So um, we do look forward to having you back in July. And I just want to tell everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we hope that you stay well and um, we look forward to seeing you in one of our live classes at CVAR when we're back, back to the normal. So thanks so much, Ryan, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time.
Yeah, thank you so much, guys, for letting me take a few hours a day today. Really appreciate it. All right, everyone, bye. Thank you.